Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I'd like to call the March 3rd meeting of uh, the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Uh, clerk, could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Conway? Here. Greenberg? Here. Kennedy? Here. Maxwell? Uh, Ms. Miller? Here. Different? Here. 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 Uh, we'll keep an eye out for Commissioner Maxwell. He was here, so he just had some um, internet issues. Are there, uh, well, I think Commissioner Maxwell would be the only absentee, so um, we move along. Are there any statements of disqualification from any of the commissioners this evening? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to the next item. The next item is oral communications. This is a time for members of the public to address the commission for items not on the agenda tonight. So items that are not agendized on uh, this evening's agenda, but, but are in the purview of the commission. If you would like to speak on an item not on the agenda tonight, now is the time to raise your hand and you will have uh, three minutes. Are you seeing any hand raised for non-agenda items? I do, and I'd like to find where that we have a small lag. Those who are watching, uh, but yes, I. Do. Yes, please. Um, please identify yourself, and you will have three minutes. You'll hear a beep at the end of those three minutes, and please wrap up your comments at that time. Uh, Go can ahead. you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Robert Norris, and I am a, a worker with a group called Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Um, I recently received a phone call this morning, actually, from a woman living in her van. This has nothing to do with the OVO law. It has to do with a 72-hour parking problem that uh, seems to be improperly enforced by the police. And I'm concerned that the Planning Commission, which may have some jurisdiction over or at least impact on the, uh, the whole issue of permit parking elsewhere in the city, which has nothing to do, again, with banning RVs or anything per se, but it has to do rather with uh, the use of the 72-hour law, I should say the misuse of the 72-hour law, to essentially uh, deny people who are whose shelter is their vehicles in all parts of the city from actually uh, being able to survive outside without being harassed. Um, this concerns a particular police officer, uh, Joe Haby, who has uh, been reported to me time and time again as being a very active participant in giving what individuals who are suffering this kind of harassment claim are bogus citations. I think he feels it is his obligation to try to move along vehicles in neighborhoods. Now, I, I don't know what kind of action the Planning Commission can take on this kind of behavior, but it's a particular concern to a woman, uh, Alicia Cool, who has been to you before, and you actually have supported her in the past, although City Council turned you down when the attempt was made to uh, appeal uh, a restrictive ordinance on parking. This time, it's simply straightforward writing on her tires, we're going to tow, banging on her door at 4.30 at night, ignoring the fact that she has paid all her citations. I'm concerned about this more broadly, not just for her. Now, she's an activist with a group called uh, the Santa Cruz Homeless Union, and as such may be, I'm not saying she necessarily is, but she may be a target because of her outspoken opposition to police department policy generally on this issue. 
There is a legitimate use for the 72-hour storage law if people are abandoning their vehicles or parking beyond that period of time. But if they're not, the question arises, how can the public be protected from over-eager enforcers, of which there are many? The police department has at least 35 volunteer parking uh, sort of para-police who are <laughs> empowered to uh, go about and green stickers. So into this issue, and thank you for uh, for hearing this. Uh, thank you for your comments. Okay, um, moving on to the next caller, a reminder to attendees that um, this is a time for non-agenda items. So we'll go ahead and move to the next caller. Um, clerk, go ahead and unmute. Yes, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, this is Rafa Sanan Feld. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, ask the um, commission to consider um, uh, a work plan or, or um, and maybe this is already in the works, but um, uh, coming up with a schedule or policy areas uh, that uh, the commission is interested in including in the, um, the housing element update that the city will be undertaking over the next um, couple of years. Um, I think there's opportunities for the commission to, um, you know, uh, potentially suggest certain types of programs that can affirmatively further for housing, uh, create uh, opportunities for more affordable housing, incentivize affordable housing development. Um, and, uh, you know, this could be a really transformative time for our community. So I just hope that, that you all are thinking proactively um, about, you know, working with uh, the planning department, uh, staff and consultants, um, as well as, you know, the public and um, uh, facilitating the public engagement process on, on the housing element um, update. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, I think we have one more hand. Please identify yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, Reggie Meisler here. I'm about to talk in a second anyways, but I just wanted to piggyback off of what Robert was saying. Um, as a Santa Cruz CARES member who's canvassed uh, vehicles in the sort of natural bridges Delaware area, we've had people say that um, they are participants in the AFC program, but they still receive parking tickets as though they had parked overnight or for three days. Um, so the police are not making any sort of like uh, attempt to keep track of who is uh, participating and registered uh, in programs like AFC, um, which I find problematic. Um, on top of obviously the very, uh, let's say, um, ideological uh, folks who operate in um, the uh, volunteer police program, which thinks with ACLU uh, has shut down for the time being. Um, and then the last thing is I want, want to piggyback off of uh, what Rafa was mentioning, which is that the city general plan uh, discourages um, uh, dilapidated or sort of like older motels and hotels from being turned into lodging, which is uh, antithetical to what the county is doing and what the state overall is doing with Project Home Key which is a very successful program. There's a UCLA, a UCLA study that says that Project Home Key and just the sort of acquisition and transformation of uh, hotels and motels um, into permanent, affordable house, uh, permanent supportive housing and affordable housing is the fastest, most cost-effective approach um, during this time of crisis. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Um, Clerk, any more hands for um, oral communication? Any other? Just give it one more second for the lag, and then we'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay, um, moving on to the next agenda item, which is the approval of the minutes for the February 17th meeting. 
is uh, does anyone um is there any discussion or questions from commissioners um i'd also entertain a motion for uh approval of the minutes i'll move the minutes i'll second okay moved by commissioner schifrin seconded by commissioner kennedy um clerk we please have a roll call commissioner conway aye greenberg aye Aye. Maxwell. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, minutes are approved for the February seventeenth meeting. Okay, uh, moving on to our one and only public hearing item tonight, um, the citywide uh, project uh, CP10173, um, uh, appeal of the zoning administrator approval of the uh, uh, coastal and design permits to authorize development associated um, with the oversized vehicle ordinance. So. Before we launch into this agenda item, um, I just want to take a moment to clarify for all of us in attendance what is before the commission and sort of the process moving forward. You're going to hear more about this in the staff presentation, but I just wanted to take a moment to kind of ground us all um, as we move into this agenda item. And so um, what is before the commission is, is the approval of the permits required to implement the oversized vehicle ordinance, which was adopted by the council last year. So that is what is being considered. And it's being considered um, in a fashion called the de novo, which means that we're not gonna actually be considering taking action or making a finding on the appeals. The appeals will be used by the commissioners in addition to the staff um, report and the, the testimony given by the public to inform the decision about issuing the permit. So I just want to make it really clear that again, we're not going to make a finding on the appeals, but we are going to hear the appeals to help inform our decision. And um, the order of events will be, we'll go ahead and get a staff report. There are two appeals. Um, each appellant will have up to 10 minutes. So, that, so we'll hear a staff report, we'll get any clarifying questions from the commissioners. Each appellant will have 10 minutes, and then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and hear testimony from the public, close this public hearing, and then bring it back for consideration um, by the commissioners. And I also just want to talk briefly, and again, you'll hear about this from staff, um, the process once a decision is made here tonight. So. Um, again, what's in consideration is for the um, issuance of the required permits to implement the ordinance. If those are accepted, um, those will be processed, and that, that decision is appealable to the Coastal Commission. If, if the permits were not issued by the Commission tonight, that, um, that decision of the Planning Commission is appealable to the City Council. So, again, staff will clarify anything and um, we, we can also have clarifying questions from other commissioners after the staff report. Um, so I will briefly pause there to make sure I didn't misstate anything from staff. Uh, so I'm not seeing any staff shaking their head. So I think I, think I laid it out okay. And so we will go ahead and move into uh, a staff report from Mr. Ferry. And I do wanna thank staff again for um, their back and forth over the last two days, helping me prepare and kind of understand how to facilitate this discussion tonight. So, Mr. Ferry, staff report. Okay. Please. Thank you. Um, Mike Ferry, I'm a temporary part time um, planner with the city at this point. Um, so, this is my first sharing screens and all that stuff. So, you guys might have to let me know if it's happening. Can you see that screen that says Planning Commission, March 3rd? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
and I want to swap screens. Okay. Um, my understanding is this project number is CP210174, not 73. <clears throat> and it's basically um, an appeal of the zoning administrator's approval of a design permit and a coastal permit to authorize uh, development uh, based on the uh, Title 10 changes that the uh, City Council approved last year. So a coastal permit is required <clears throat> because, and not a local coastal plan amendment because Title 10, that section of the municipal code that was changed for oversized vehicles, that's not part of the local coastal plan. However, in the coastal zone, development, um, just the signage alone that restricts the oversized vehicles would require a coastal permit just in and of itself. Uh, safe parking lots located in the coastal zone would always would also require a coastal permit. When you have a public project located in the coastal zone, the zoning ordinance requires that a design permit be approved. So that's why we had a coastal permit and a design permit, and that was to implement the Title uh, 10 changes uh, that dealt with the oversized vehicles. Now, the design permit may also be used in a case outside the coastal zone. For instance, if uh, a parking, a free parking lot was going, or a safe parking was going to be constructed on a uh, industrial site, they would need a design permit to change their approved site plan. So it was approved by the city council, the Title 10 amendments in November. Coastal and design permits are required to implement in the zoning district. The coastal and design permits were approved by the zoning administrator in January, and that approval was appealed by Reggie Meister, I think is uh, how he pronounces it, and the ACLU. So the appeals referencing the coastal and design permit um, have been answered extensively in the uh, staff report. Uh, we've cut and pasted both the appeals into the report and um, worked with the city attorney and um, some public works folks and responded to that. So I'm not going to go over all of those items. But one of the um, preliminary things that stood out to me was both of them said that, um, that the uh, Title 10 changes criminalized homelessness, eliminated access to the coast, and that there was lack of community input in developing the ordinance. So I'm going to go through those three items. So it doesn't criminalize homelessness. Um, implementing the parking regulations in the coastal zone is between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. Violations are a parking permit. It's not a, a criminal citation. It's just a parking permit like anybody gets when they park in the wrong spot. Uh, coastal and design permits will allow the city to serve at no cost unhoused city residents living in oversized vehicles through the provisions of the safe overnight parking places. And currently, we don't have, uh, well, as of a couple months ago, we didn't have any uh, sponsored sites like that. So um, the other thing about the, um, the spaces is, if the uh, recreational vehicle is registered for one of those spaces and all of the safe parking lots are full, they can park on the street. Um, and they display their um, permit and they won't be in violation. Uh, safe parking locations would offer the minimum trash, restroom, and hand washing facilities, all of them. So it doesn't eliminate coastal access. Um, it eliminates parking between midnight and 5 a.m., but Maine and Cal Beach have the same kinds of hours, midnight to 5 a.m. Coast Commission approved parking restrictions on West Cliff between midnight and 5 a.m. Lighthouse State Beach closes and locks its uh, parking areas from sunset to 7 a.m. Natural Bridges does the same from sunset to 8 a.m. 
the recreational access is going to be maintained from 5 a.m. until midnight, 19 hours each day. In terms of community input, um, between 2016 and 17, the council appointed a homeless coordinating committee to research prepared recommendations related to homelessness. 2019, they established the CASH committee to engage the community in a, a variety of policies related to homelessness. CATCH membership included people with a wide range of experience and knowledge, including individuals who either were or had been unhoused. Over the course of the year, the CASH community, uh, committee held about 16 public meetings and uh, a lot of subcommittee meetings with and without staff. CASH made a range of recommendations to the council, such as expansion of the sanctioned camping and safe, safe sleeping, including oversized vehicle parking. And this safe parking program would provide those things. The expansion of parking capacity at faith-based parking lots was one of their suggestions, and the city council has approved it. Expanded access to restrooms, hand washing stations downtown and elsewhere for another of their recommendations, and the safe parking program will provide that as well. Creation of new Blackwater dumping sites was a recommendation, and options are currently being evaluated along with the safe parking program. The outreach um, also included the County of Santa Cruz. They had in 2015 all towards home and every county resident. Um, in 2021, they had housing for a healthy Santa Cruz, and the city council endorsed that study. And then the point in time homeless census data. Um, and the most recent one was completed today, and the, the information is not out yet. Um, the city council received over 400 letters in response to the proposal related to oversight vehicle parking. Uh, public hearing feedback at Transportation and Public Works Commissions and at the City Council when considering oversized vehicle parking on uh, Olive Street. And I wasn't here for that, but um, I've heard that uh, that was quite a number of uh, commenters on that. The Ad Hoc Council Committee engaged community members, public health, homeless service providers, members of the Association of Faith Communities, those are the folks that operate the safe parking programs on the churches and uh, some of the city sites. County staff, board of supervisor members. Uh, three city council meetings were heard specifically for the oversized vehicle ordinance, and approximately 400 letters were received. The city council, when they approved the uh, Title 10 amendments, they also passed a motion to implement the safe parking program. And that included a three-tiered approach, emergency overnight safe parking on city-owned parcels for at least three vehicles to be implemented immediately, an overnight parking program on city-owned parcels or other non-residential approved parcels for a minimum of 30 vehicles throughout the city to be implemented within four months of passing the Title 10 ordinance revisions, and a robust safe parking program in partnership with service providers, health providers, and county partners, with the following subpopulations being prioritized, families with children, seniors, transitional age youth, veterans, and those with a valid uh, disabled placard. In February of 22, the city is now operating three safe parking locations that allow for nine vehicles to park as part of the Tier 1 and Tier 2 parking programs as directed by the city council. Initial pilot that we're currently operating will solicit feedback from participants living in the vehicles, and modifications will be of value to the program as it expands. Two of these locations currently have additional off-street expansion capacity. Current desire uh, among staff is to keep each location small with up to approximately six vehicles in each. So when we did the design permit and the coastal permit findings, we wanted to have 
um, a lot of general language <clears throat> because it's it's not site specific. And the planning or the um, Coastal Commission staff agreed that this was something that they would be able to uh, work with. So generally, the off-street locations and public or private property will be on public or private property um, lots. Hours will generally be from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Sanitation will be provided at all locations, no cost to the participants. Three tiered facilities, these are the enhanced facilities, will be operated with extended hours, including 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, city staff is currently evaluating two of those tier three proposals right now. Additional support includes after analyzing best practices in other communities, members of the community suggest some ideas to bring forward. A voucher program for um, wastewater dumping and a limited number of financial sub subsidies for individuals who are trying to repair their cars or get them registered. These funds would be established through partnerships and neighborhood groups. So the Planning Commission can approve the coastal and the design permit. If that approval is not appealed, the city sends the Coastal Commission a final local action notice, a FLAN. When the Coastal Commission gets the FLAN, they start a 10-day appeal period and the public can appeal for free directly to the Coastal Commission. Um, the Planning Commission's decision tonight can also be uh, appealed to the City Council. However, there is the fee. I think it's $699 right now. And that's because of the design permit that's attached to the coastal permit. So appealing to the City Council is going to be a $699 fee. Um, and uh, the Planning Commission could also deny the coastal and the um, design permit and most likely that would be appealed up to the uh, city council council members could do that uh, or other people and i think that uh, ends my presentation so i have to stop sharing the screen somewhere okay right there hey, okay thank you thank you um Commissioners, uh, this is a time we could ask any clarifying questions to staff from what you've heard um, before we go yeah. on to the Is there any clarifying questions about the information that was just presented from any commissioners? Uh, yes, Commissioner Conway. I uh, was just curious, and I'm sorry I didn't catch this, that um, staff is currently evaluating two uh, tier three proposals. I would understood that um, that the request for proposals were out, but I didn't understand that they were evaluating them. So there were two responses. Is that right? Uh, Lee. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Lee Hello. Butler, deputy city manager, and thanks for that question, Commissioner Conway. Yes, um, we've had a rolling request for qualifications out for um, about nine months now. And um, prior to the last um, review timeline, which was in February, we received two proposals for uh, tier three state parking facilities. And yes, we are evaluating those and um, will be, um, and anticipate moving forward with one of those once the scoring is completed. Okay, I'm glad to hear that, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other clarifying questions from commissioners before we move on to the appellant? Okay, just a reminder, we're gonna give each appellant up to 10 minutes uh, to present us um, with information from their appeal. And Mr. Ferry, are you gonna run the um, slides for the appellant or what is the order in which uh, you guys are set up for, to, to hear the appellant information? Um, I talked to the ACLU today and they're not going to have any slideshows. They're just going to speak. And I'm going to um, do the slideshow for Reggie. 
Okay. Well, why don't why don't we go ahead and hear from the ACLU first? Um, I'm not sure who the representative is, but for with a representative from the ACLU, please raise your hand, and you will have up to 10 minutes uh, to speak. Okay, uh, clerk, can you go ahead and unmute? Looks like John has raised his hand. Okay, go ahead. Uh, good evening, um, commissioners and staff. My name is John Doe. I'm an attorney with the ASOU of Northern California. And with disability rights advocates and on behalf of certain local ACOU members and folks directly impacted by the ordinance and permit, we filed one of the appeals at issue here. We have been monitoring Santa Cruz's treatment of its unhoused constituents for some time now, and we view the OSC ordinance and the permit as an unfortunate tool and a misguided attempt to drive out unhoused people out of the city rather than lead with real services. Now, this is a population that's disproportionately black, people of color, and folks with disabilities. We ask that you reconsider the coastal permit in order to preclude enforcement of the OSV ordinance. The permit's inconsistent with the inclusive goals of Santa Cruz's general plan, violates the coastal access principles embedded in the state's constitution, it's cruel and otherwise ineffective. Santa Cruz should not be limited to those who are able to afford the limited housing here. We're hopeful that the city may be willing to commit to finding real solutions. And to do so, the city should concretely commit to parking alternatives that are practically available to, to anyone in the real world for folks who, actually, who live in their vehicle. Now I'd like to focus my limited time here um, by rebutting some of the staff's comments and presentation. Foremost, the, the city relies heavily on section 1040-120-G7 which exempts certain folks who are part of a safe parking program that at the present time does not have nearly enough capacity to serve the needs of vehicle housed people. Now, although we support safe parking alternatives generally, there are a few false premises baked into this exemption and practical realities that the city has failed to consider. First, the exemption presumes there will be safe parking that people can actually register at but there remains no legal requirement that the city has sufficient available spaces for people before enforcement, nor is the permit automatically void if sufficient spaces are not made available. The city doesn't contest this. Now, although the city has plans and desires to run a pilot parking program, plans and desires must first be translated into actual spaces. And so until this year, six years after the prior ordinance was rejected by the Coastal Commission, the city didn't directly fund a single parking spot, not one. It's only now that the city has apparently secured three locations. And now the city also promised that it would have its second tier 30, 30 spots available this week, um, four months after the original passage of the uh, city uh, from city, uh, city council. But it doesn't appear that's on track. And even if the city meets its goal of a three tiered safe parking program, it still falls short of the need. Which leads me to my second point. For the exemption to work, there can't be barriers to registration. Things such as costly vehicular registration, questionable background checks, curfews that require the costly requirement to come and go, onerous, intrusive, and vague behavioral guidelines are all barriers. Such conditions are ripe for abuse and discrimination. And folks in traditional fixed housing aren't generally subject to them. Even if the city were to commit to making spaces available on a trial basis with no barriers, it has yet to commit to, it has yet to, commit to the absence of these barriers as a permanent feature of any program, assuming the program even continues to exist. Similarly, although we laud faith communities providing compassionate, accessible services, any faith-based requirement would likely not be suitable. And lastly, it would be impractical and concerning for the city to make registering for a program a prerequisite to avoid enforcement under the ordinance until the city has actually committed to making sufficient low or no barrier spaces available. Without this commitment, there'll be no incentive for people to register for a parking program. It's not realistic to expect that they would register. Now, that being said, signing people who have failed to register would still be very punitive and counterproductive. And in any event, there is no system in place to ensure that folks are registered before there is enforcement, as one of the uh, prior 
um, members of the public previously said earlier today. So again, we urge the city to adopt a real commitment to all types of parking alternatives that are untethered to enforcement. Now, another issue I want to respond to is the staff's report statement that the coastal permit doesn't, quote, criminalize the act of living in vehicles, end quote. The thing is, the associated, per the associated ordinance effectively does just that. First, it subjects people to a misdemeanor, which can lead to arrest for the crime of having trash that may not even be theirs. It does this by, again, imposing a requirement that the area surrounding a vehicle be kept clear of trash, even though, again, the trash may be dumped by somebody else. Secondly, the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment is not limited to just jail time or criminal penalties. Civil fines are punishments under the Eighth Amendment. Limiting one's parking options, fining them, increasing someone's risk of losing one's home for unpaid tickets inflicts untold cruel trauma. There are tools for the city that can use to address their concerns. Given that there are other laws that address things like sewage dumping, or the possibility of providing options for disposal, this blunt draconian ordinance and permit should not be one of those tools. Next, I wanna highlight the short shrift that the city provided with regards to the disability issues at play here. Merely stating that safe parking facilities will be accessible isn't enough. The proposed or enforcement scheme itself has no reasonable accommodations for folks with disabilities. In highlighting the fact that tier three safe parking programs will prioritize people with disabil disability placards um, is entirely under-inclusive of people with disabilities. And the location of the parking is vital. Pushing people to the far corners of the city or maybe even out of the city, away from the coast where daytime parking is now more restricted, unquestionably limits access to the coast for folks like Ms. Crow, one of our clients. Now, equally brief is the city's response to the environmental justice and inclusive principles found in the Coastal Act and the city's general plan. Again, it's not enough to just say the city does not discriminate. Rather, there should be an affirmative duty to promote access to the city for people who have been historically been and currently are excluded, including black folks, people of color, poor folks, people with disabilities, among other groups. What the city proposes to do through this ordinance and the permit, it's privileged the voices and complaints of the well-to-do, people who can afford to have fixed housing in Santa Cruz. Now the city is quick to cite to their complaint, but not to the majority of public comments today um, and in the past who oppose the permit and the ordinance. Make sure the house people and their advocates are also your constituents, and we ask that you live up to the constitutional requirements and inclusive ideals that the city claims to hold. Reject the permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doe. Can we go ahead and move to the second appellate, uh, Reggie Meisler and Mr. Ferry can, uh, I believe Reggie has some slides. So can we go ahead and uh, unmute Reggie and uh, Mr. Ferry, can you pull up the slides? Can you see okay, it? Thank you. Yes, right. we can. Okay. Go, All go right, ahead. Thanks, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you have up to 10 minutes. Go ahead, Reggie. All right, great. All right, Mike, I'm going to go kind of fast here, so <laughs> I hope you can keep up. Uh, hi, my name is Reggie Meisler. I am a member of the Santa Cruz CARES Organizing Committee presenting on our appeal of the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance. Next slide. Uh-oh. There we go. Sorry. Uh, I think you skipped the slide. Uh, just left left arrow, just left, just use left and right arrows on your keyboard. I was trying that. Okay, sorry. And then go back one. Okay. Okay, can, can we start over or something? I feel like that was kind of a loss of time. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so these are all the organizations that supported us uh, in our appeal and uh, form formulated their own appeal in some cases. So I want to thank them for their support. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so <clears throat> Santa Cruz CARES has already sent a robust 24-page document discussing how the OVO violates the general plan, health and all policies, and why Coastal Commission is unlikely to give it a permit. 
as well as how Lee Butler's wife, being a coastal program analyst, represents a potential conflict of interest. We hope that commissioners have read this document and public correspondence under Sabina Holder and Rachel Chavez ahead of making their decision today. But today we'd like to focus our presentation on the human cost of criminalizing our unhoused neighbors and vehicles, uh, as OVO does, and hopefully demonstrate to you why it doesn't have to be this way. Next slide. Sometimes it uh, goes and sometimes it doesn't, Reggie. Uh, try clicking the, uh, the, yeah, just click it. Okay. Um, How about that? Okay, that's good. Sorry. In the middle of the night during this past winter, Santa Cruz uh, police towed a multi-generational family, including a medically fragile grandmother, her daughter, and her young grandson, who's about 10 years old, as well as their pet. This action was in stark contrast to Santa Cruz police's claim that they do not tow vehicles with uh, children and vulnerable elderly people in them. Left with only tents to survive, this family set up camp right next to where their vehicle was once parked on Schaefer Road. The only reason they had these tents, however, was because the grandmother thought quickly to throw the tents out of the vehicle as it was being towed. Otherwise, they would have been left entirely without shelter during some of the coldest and wettest times of the year. Next slide. Santa Cruz CARES members met with the family and provided them with wood pallets so that their tents would at least be raised above the dirt floor as rain was expected the following night. Meanwhile, the city did not appear to provide any assistance to the family, uh, including motel vouchers, support services, or alternative shelter options. Several weeks later, the city visited the family again, but not to assist them, but to take away their pets, which were a litter of kittens. Next slide. Most recently, just a week ago, the family was told by Santa Cruz police that they had three days to move their tent and all of their belongings to San Lorenzo Park, three miles away. Otherwise, their survival gear would be thrown away. This is what criminalizing poverty and keeping people trapped in a cycle of poverty looks like. And we can expect to see more stories like this if you allow OVO to receive a coastal design permit today. Next slide. So why does it have to be this way? Santa Cruz CARES believes in service-oriented policies without the threat of criminalization. Is that possible? Does it work? Let's look at evidence provided by our own city staff and their experiments to take a look. Next slide. Here we have staff provided a trash receptacle on Schaefer Road, where a number of our unhoused vehicles park, uh, unhoused neighbors park their oversized vehicles. Staff claims that the use of the trash receptacle here was ineffective at mitigating impacts and that this photo is evidence of that. But let's take a closer look. Next slide. There is no trash near the vehicles or in the road. There's no debris. Next slide. Trash appears to be conscientiously placed either in the bin or next to the bin, which is fairly full. And hopefully staff can think of some reasons themselves, why some people may not be able to put things in the trash can, particularly when the unhoused population has an intersection with physical disability and old age. Next slide. Here we have another photo taken around the same time as the last photo, but after trash has been picked up. And you can see that it's almost immaculate in its view. Um, so is there really a problem here? Apartment complexes with trash chutes often have more spillover than what's being documented here. Let's take a deeper look with some numbers. Next slide. The city cites the cost of providing trash service to vehicles on Schaefer Road, Natural Bridges, and Delaware Street uh, Avenue to be $21,000 a year. The total number of oversized vehicles in town is said to be about 300. Now the percentage of oversized vehicles on the far west side is about 40% as estimated by staff in their September 21st report. So despite staff claims that the service area of this trash can uh, and the others uh, are along that area was relatively narrow um, by saying only serving the far west side with the $21,000 citation, uh, we see that this is, uh, this is a little uh, out of sync because a large plurality of our unhoused neighbors park on the far west side. Next slide. Comparing the sum to the cited 
uh, cost by staff to establish a safe parking program to serve only 30 vehicles, 10%, um, we see an enormous discrepancy in cost. There are at least 30 vehicles on Schaefer Road alone. Next slide. Um, looking at staff's notes on the subject and the response to our appeal, they say that safe parking programs mitigate impacts by providing services. Note, they do not claim that any kind of threats of harm or strict rules like no drug use are what mitigate impacts, only the provision of services. Next slide. Later, they describe what these services are in more detail, and we see that these services are what is often provided to homeless camps already. These are portable and easy to provide to a location like the far west side at present. Next slide. In explaining how they deal with Blackwater, again, staff notes that this would be a mobile service, something staff could easily provide to residents on the far west side today without the need for establishing a high barrier entry safe parking zone that serves only 10% of the population of our unhoused neighbors and vehicles and criminalizes the rest. Next slide. As staff admits in their response to our appeal, they indeed already provide services to people where they are, though these services are not complete. And in doing so, they see an impressive reduction in impacts at a relatively low cost per capita. Surprisingly, staff seems to agree with Santa Cruz Cares that it is the services they provide which mitigate impacts, not threats of criminalization, which are unfortunately the focus of OVO. We find then that the data and arguments staff provide are incongruent with the narrative they are trying to develop. It's clear that people provi uh, providing people services where they are is radically cheaper and serves more people than taking those services and locating them behind a high barrier enclosed area, which requires folks living in vehicles to meet requirements that many fail to meet, including having up-to-date vehicle registration, license tags, and more. Furthermore, social scientists and cash agree that ticketing vehicles for minor offenses does not even curb the behavior that supporters hope to be curbed as these behaviors are not the result of intentional misdeeds, but the result of impoverishment and a lack of access to needed infrastructure, which again, staff seems to agree with. In a presentation given by staff and former police chief Mills last September, Mills noted that the process of towing oversized vehicles of the unhoused is an unsustainable form of punishment. Private tow yards don't want to store these vehicles because their owners cannot afford to pay the fees to get them out. And the, because of the reduced market value of metal, metal scrapping cannot make up the cost of towing them and storing them. Furthermore, the makeshift tow yard the city created at the landfill, with no public input or legislative oversight, by the way, is also at capacity and landfill staff cannot deal with any more than they already are. Next slide. Um, oh, uh, sorry, I think I was on the wrong. Uh, can you go to the next slide after that? Yeah, I was desynced there. Um, <clears throat> uh, in conclusion, the city is not only perfectly capable of implementing service-oriented policy without the threat of criminalization, but they already have done so in various ways. And it seems that through trial and error, the city has kind of stumbled into what social scientists and policy researchers have already been telling us which is that criminalization is ineffective and expensive and providing services to people works at mitigating impacts and is cost effective. Thus, we find OVO's focus being placed on discriminatory parking permit programs to enhance the city's ability to ticket and prosecute people for crimes of poverty to be misguided and in conflict with not only policy researchers and what they say is efficacious, but with their own data. This means that the OVO as written will only properly address impacts for the 10% of oversized vehicles in town that are able to participate, but worsen impacts for the remaining 90%. <clears throat> we suggest that the planning commission side with research and data and not staff's misguided narratives. Next slide. The fight won't end here for Santa Cruz Cares. We're gonna keep on building the coalition. We're gonna keep on fighting against all forms of uh, poverty criminalization. And if you agree with, with us, please join us, santacruzcares.org, at Santa Cruz Cares on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. 
Okay, can uh, we stop sharing the screen and go back uh, to the commissioners? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on and open the public hearing. And this is gonna be a time for the public to address the commission um, on this item. So if you would like to speak, now is the time to raise your hand. So please uh, raise your hand if you would like to address the commission. And we'll kind of give a second for the delay, see how many folks would like to address the commission. I wanna give you all plenty of time to get in on the public hearing. So again, I've opened the public hearing for this agenda item on the oversized vehicle ordinance. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Um, and based on what I'm seeing right now, we'll go ahead and give, give each each person three minutes and you will hear a, a chime from the clerk at the end of your time. So once you hear that chime, I, I would ask everyone to please be respectful and go ahead and wrap up. So clerk, can we go ahead and move on to public testimony? Each person will have three minutes. Please identify yourself and first person can go ahead. Sure you're on the line. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself this evening. Um, uh, as a former um, member of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, I, um, I think I, I know as well as anyone, you know, what um, what went through the processes of uh, developing recommendations for, uh, for the city's policies on homelessness. And, um, Safe parking programs, I think, are a good, are good, uh, good supplement uh, and a, a good option for the city to be to be taking up. Um, I I think the um, the city should be supporting safe parking programs, but um, not at the expense of uh, the folks who can't access those services and. Um, the criminalization in particular, the aspects of the oversized vehicle ordinance uh, uh, that um, make it more challenging for folks to access services, to get housing, um, are really counterproductive. Um, I'm disappointed, <clears throat> excuse me, that the city um, decided to go down that path. Um, you know, we've heard from the ACLU tonight why it's incredibly flawed uh, and um, frankly this just feels like like a big wasted energy um, because we're going to end up in court and it's going to be struck down and we could be focusing on solutions that are actually moving us forward so I, I think we should you know uh, cut the losses cut the staff time I, I know I, I recognize that the you know there's politics at the city council that will come into play and it'll probably be appealed anyway. But, you know, I think this body can be uh, the, the voices of reason in this conversation. And uh, uh, for the purposes of, you know, the, the parking, uh, street parking aspects of, of this permit, I, I suggest that you uh, don't approve those aspects. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next caller, you have three minutes to identify yourself and go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Logan Haug. I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I speak to you tonight as a member of the Student Housing Coalition. I urge you to appeal the oversized vehicle ordinance. This ordinance will criminalize houselessness through its vague language. Regardless of whether it's a parking ticket or a misdemeanor charged through the police, houseless persons are extremely vulnerable. In fact, some of the most vulnerable members of our society in Santa Cruz. We need to stop criminalizing the houseless and begin a services first based approach instead of approving this hurtful ordinance that will only perpetuate the cycle of houselessness and saddle needless financial burden on our most mem uh, vulnerable members of society. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, go ahead. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Michelle. 
Um, hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm a first-year student at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm with the Student Housing Coalition. I'm here asking you to support the ACLU and Santa Cruz CARES appeal of the Oversized Vehicle Ordinance. So firstly, I'd like to say I support a services-based approach to homelessness in Santa Cruz. Speaking personally, one of my friends and a personal role model of mine had experienced homelessness during his second year at UC Santa Cruz. He cites that time as the most frightening and stressful time of his life as he had to maintain both his studies and a part-time job while living in extremely dangerous and unstable conditions. During that time, sheltering in an RV in the city would have been a welcome alternative to the situation he was truly in, and it saddens me to see that for others that possibility may be outlawed and likely aggressive penalized by the oversized vehicle ordinance. Finding those who can afford fixed housing or a stable lifestyle, even going so far as to assign a misdemeanor for miscellaneous garbage that is found around an RV, all with an absence of a substantial effort to provide public services like garbage collection or safe parking spaces, is a misguided approach to solve homelessness. As previously stated, we need to adopt a services first approach without the threat of criminalization for our most vulnerable members of our county. I believe that the board would agree that imposing financial burdens and impounding the homes people rely on is not an efficient, nor is it even an efficacious way to combat homelessness. It simply perpetuates the cycle that causes homelessness and frankly wastes county resources by chasing after homeless people, slapping a Band-Aid over an issue rather than alleviating it. Pushing them to the fringes of our society and going so far as to treat their bodies and belongings as pollution is not a line we should cross. I support preventing the OVO from receiving a permit to be enforced in this coastal zone and urge you to side with the ACLU and Santa Cruz CARES Appeal. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michelle. We'll go ahead and go to the next person. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Denon. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Denon Elliott Crow. I'm the president of the Student Housing Coalition coming out today uh, to speak against this. Uh, and I always wanted to go ahead and talk about the personal connection as students from UC Santa Cruz. As you just heard, someone who knew a friend who was living out of their vehicle called it the hardest time of their lives. And even I personally know people that are living out of their vehicles who can't afford a place to live. You know, 9% of UC Santa Cruz students are homeless. It's a crisis, and we see many, many students living out of their vehicles, and we see that with this ordinance that there could be a lot of harm to those constituencies, those people that are trying to study, trying to better themselves with a UC education. You know, we see that this is a really important part of their lives, and if they don't have a home, how are they supposed to go through school? How are they supposed to graduate? And so when we talk about this policy and we talk about bring it to a broader picture, you know, the talks about reform of the criminalization of people who shouldn't be criminalized, who should be helped. This is a policy that does not belong in this era of social change, in this era where we've looked at policies of past that have harmed, you know, our society as a whole. And so when I look to this and I look to see where we should be going, I don't think this is the measure of way we should be going. And that's why I strongly encourage you guys to go ahead and, and deny the permit. Thank you. Thank you, Zenon. We'll go ahead and go to the next caller. Um, go ahead and identify yourself and you'll have three minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Bodhi Shargal. Um, thank you for hearing our everyone's public comment. Um, I'm a UCSD student. Uh, I'm a I'm a lifelong Santa Cruz County resident. Um, I'm here with the uh, Student Housing Coalition as well as as well as the um, Santa Cruz chapter of the YDSA. Uh, I support the appeal of the oversized vehicle ordinance um, being barred from fixed housing um, as well as homelessness in general are categorically human rights violations. Um, I don't like that. I don't want homelessness to exist. But criminalizing those experiencing homelessness does not in any way, shape, or form help the situation. Um, banning RVs just, is, um, just forces people into smaller cars or other worse options. Uh, and we can do a lot of things to fix these problems, but the oversized vehicle ordinance is not one of them. Uh, Santa Cruz is in desperate need of affordable housing. Santa Cruz is in desperate need of uh, social services for those experiencing homelessness. Santa Cruz is not in desperate need of a law banning people living in RVs. 
um, and we can we can devote the resources that we are devoting to criminalizing homelessness to a lot of much better things. Um, and I hope that um, those of you on the commission can agree with me on that and, and appeal or repeal the oversized vehicle ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, the next caller, you identify yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Adrian. I uh, am a fourth generation Santa Cruz resident. Uh, I'm currently living along the levee, and I do have to say that after this OVO ordinance went into effect, the <laughs> living along the levee got a lot nastier. And I personally don't want folks feeling the need to come rifle around in my backyard and finding somewhere to sleep behind a bush or behind my car, behind my belongings. Uh, alongside that, it is undoubtedly cruel. You guys seem to want to argue whether or not this is criminalization, but kicking someone out of somewhere that is warm and somewhere that has shelter uh, and putting them out again when it was raining and making them sleep in the tent and in the dirt is cruel. But that's not the kind of place that I want to live. And I don't think that that is connecting with how folks that live here and have lived here for generations want to see their community going. So again, I would like to uh, advise you guys accept the appeal. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We we'll go ahead and go to the next caller. Go ahead and identify yourself. You have three minutes. Hello, yes. Uh, my name is Joseph Thompson. I'm here representing um, the Young Democratic Socialist of America chapter in Santa Cruz along with a um, student housing coalition. Um, and lastly, I'm leading the charge of the immunization at our local Starbucks. Um, I come to you guys today to um, ask you guys to accept the um, accept ACLU and Santa Cruz appeal, um, a CARES appeal to the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, my main purpose against this is when I was working at my Starbucks location, um, we had a regular um, who would come in, very nice man. He'd just come in, sit down, order his coffee, um, and, you know, never had any problems with him. And one day I was talking with him, and he, he told me that he was homeless. Um, and I had no idea. And he then, you know, told me that he was living out of his car. He had, you know, served in the military, and, you know, he had no other choice. And, you know, um, since this ordinance has been passed, I, I haven't seen him since. Um, and it, it's heartbreaking. To, to hear the impact of this on normal people who are just trying to get by, who have been let down by our society time and time again. And I, I hear the, the people in this community who, who are experiencing the issues of homelessness who aren't homeless and are having to, to deal with the impact, um, you know, like as the previous you know, speaker just said about, you know, rusting around their backyard. And I, I understand that. But the idea that we are, instead of giving them services, and allowing them to, you know, continue living in this beautiful city and instead, you know, choosing to criminalize them, you know, poverty is a policy choice. And when it comes down to the end of the day, we need to be helping these people instead of further criminalizing them. You know, as another speaker said, 9% of UC students are homeless and they're living out of their vehicles, living out of their cars, and, you know, some of them could even be on the street. These are regular people trying to get an education trying to live their lives and we need to be protecting them. And obviously <laughs> with this ordinance, um, not only is it completely unlawful and, you know, goes against all, all the values that we should have in society, but it, it really is dehumanizing towards homeless people because it continues this narrative that they're, they're less than the average person. They're, they're the exact same as me. They're the exact same as every single human being because, you know, we're all the same when it comes down to it. It doesn't matter if you have a house, a mansion, you're the exact same person. And when you order a cup of coffee, it doesn't matter who you are. You're just getting a cup of coffee. And I, I hope that you guys deny the ordinance to keep going um, and, and really just stand with the Santa Cruz people who are who are here tonight in, in fighting for this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We'll go ahead and go to the next speaker. Please identify yourself and you have three minutes. Go ahead, uh, speaker, are you on the line? Savannah, we can't hear you if you're speaking. 
Okay, let's go ahead and um, put Savannah back in the queue and then we'll go to the next speaker and come back around to Savannah. Okay, speaker, you're on the line. Go ahead, you'll have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Serge Pagno of Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Um, I was a member of the CATCH and have helped run some of our homeless shelters. I've consulted with the county in setting up the vet hall shelters and the project room key. And I also uh, will admit that I live in my vehicle um, and I am affected by uh, the ordinance as well. Tonight's question is focused on giving permits for the OVO. The question is not whether the ordinance is compassionate or not. The question is not whether it's effective to housing people or not. One question that we have to, that you have to decide is whether the Coastal Act allows for limiting access to the coastal zone. The staff uh, mentioned tonight that it, he feels it does not limit access to the coastal zone because there are some beaches that are closed at night. But the issue is about low income people who can't cross the city. I have helped run some of the shelters in town and I've often heard people not being able to cross town because of gas money. So being excluded from the coastal zone at night would limit access to, for them during the coastal zone during the day. Another question as you're deciding whether to give permits for this ordinance is whether the uh, ordinance is legally written. One aspect of it, which has been mentioned tonight, is about trash around vehicles and being able to cite people, even though there's no proof that they are the ones who put the trash out. So I, I think that that's uh, simply just not legally uh, defendable. For your question tonight about giving a permit for this, I uh, suggest that you do not give permits for this until um, the city finds a different way to deal with uh, those who are low income, those who are not comfortable or feel safe to be part of programs, and until the city also has more programs and more options for people. Forcing people into programs is not uh, a, a effective way of solving this problem. The different ways of solving it, whether mobile services um, or um, having more options available, should come before giving this permit uh, for the ordinance. Thank you for your time uh, and stay safe. Thank you for your comment. Okay, we'll go back and try uh, Savannah. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes. Hello, can you guys hear me now? Absolutely, yes. go ahead. All right, thanks so much. Um, my name is Savannah. I'm a first year at UCSD, also affiliated with the Student Housing Coalition. Um, and I'm asking the council to support ACLU and Santa Cruz CARES appealing the OVO. Um, I come from San Diego and have personal experience with a family living out of their RV. Um, it was a teen that went to high school with me, their two parents and their cats. And even though they were a subpopulation that was typically given first access to safe parking and like other resources, these are all temporary and very limited and hard to achieve. Uh, so they were still largely dependent on themselves and were forced to like do their best to work around laws in order to protect their safety and the, like, the little security they had left. So government systems need to work with their unhoused populations and this can't be done by punishing them for like their own plight by imposing fines and attributing uh, their belongings as like a nuisance. Um, saddling further financial burdens and impounding their homes along with their possessions perpetuates the cycle of homelessness. And so those are, that's why I support prevent, preventing the OVO from receiving a permit. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you for your comments. We'll go ahead and go to the next caller. Please identify yourself and you'll have three minutes. Hi, uh, I'm Laz Myman. I'm with the Student Housing Coalition. Um, and honestly, I understand a lot of the frustrations that homeowners are feeling. I mean, people work hard to own their homes and they want safe neighborhoods. Um, however, 
this ordinance is not at all the right way to go about ensuring a safe community. Criminalizing people and dehumanizing them is not a means of opening community dialogue between housed and unhoused people. And simply slapping fines and misdemeanors on people is not going to solve this problem. The homelessness issue in California is deeply rooted in a lot of different things. And frankly, it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And so just having you know, an ordinance like this is not going to solve it. It's just going to shift the issue to somewhere else. And it's just going to move um, an issue from one place to another. So frankly, I think that we should work on seeing the humanity um, in people that are living in their RVs and understand that we can work together as a community to build a dialogue and to move forward um, and do it through ways that aren't criminalization and ways that are um, building up and using compassion uh, as a means of actually addressing the deep-seated issues behind homelessness uh, and behind living in oversized vehicles. So I urge the commission to accept the appeal. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Moving to the next caller, go ahead and identify yourself, caller, and you will have three minutes. Hi, this is Jasmine Mia. Um, I am calling uh, to urge you to please not issue the zoning permit for implementing OVO and coastal zones. You know, I really love that the ACLU explained how this is indeed criminalizing. I feel like staff is going on a technicality that the parking ticket is not a criminal offense. But as many have said, people can receive misdemeanors and their homes can be taken away. That is a criminal act, in my opinion, by the city. It's also extremely cruel. Reggie, on behalf of Santa Cruz Cares, made excellent points. He even used the actual facts of city staff. Please note the fiscal impact of the safe parking programs, which have barriers to access anyways. I just did the math, and for 325,000 for 10% of the OVOs served, which would be 30 of them, um, 30 OVOs, um, that would be $10,833 a year per vehicle. For the 21,000 of providing services for 40%, that's 120 vehicles, that's $175 per vehicle. So that's a huge difference and a big savings. Um, to bring services to where the people are. So you can see that the city has a narrative based on bias and discrimination. If what we care about as a city is to lift each other up and act with compassion and humanity, we would provide services to people where they are. When it comes to people's discomfort with those arguments about public nuisances and things versus other people's survival, there should be no hesitation as to whom to support. And may I add something about the arguments I hear in the um, written documents regarding environmental effects? We talk about impact on wildlife and monarchs. Are you aware of the implication here? People don't matter as much as wildlife? The city is so worried about protecting wildlife. What about protecting our fellow Santa Cruzans? It's outrageous. It is shocking to me that this is even up for consideration. Again, I urge you to take a stand and do the right thing. Do not issue this permit. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We go to the next caller who has to identify yourself and you'll have three minutes, please. Hi, um, my name is Erica Aitken. I have a business in Santa Cruz and a home as well. I also support the ACLU's appeal. According to the ACLU, the oversized vehicle ordinance is unconstitutional, uh, unconstitutional and it goes against the Disability Rights Act. To help the city with implementing the ordinance is to subject not only the city but all of us to yet another lawsuit that we will lose. That alone should be enough for you to deny the permit. But also on the human side, I support more practical and respectful solution as outlined by Santa Cruz Cares, for example, today and many times before. Please don't waste even more money on lawsuits we can't win. Deny the permit and do the right thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We go to the next caller. Please identify yourself and you'll have three minutes. Uh, I think it's important that if you didn't already say that people do not have to identify themselves to speak to this commission. Perhaps you said it at the beginning, but I think it should be made clear if there are any other speakers. There seems to be overwhelming testimony against this ordinance. My name, I don't mind identifying myself. My name is Robert Norris, and I'm with Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Um, uh, the, the real question is, will the power that the be, the council uh, and the police, actually pay any attention to the overwhelming majority of testimony that gets presented, even if you do. Um, they didn't in terms of defunding the police, and they haven't in terms of, I think, the actual 
ordinance discussions. Although I, there was a quite a uh, uh, there was quite a number of voices raised in that regard, uh, well organized voices on the right. The problem is bigotry masquerading itself, which is a form of hypocrisy. It, it's sad that the staff, as it usually does, aligns itself with a thinly disguised ordinance designed to reassure those who want to run the visible poor out of town while bombing their consciences with the illusion that resources are being provided. Now, this struggle has gone on for years, and it's likely to continue. If the Planning Commission does refuse to rubber stamp this law, it will likely, as was the case, find itself reversed by the city council, as it was in the case of Alicia Cool. Folks will have to continue to put their voices and their bodies on the line to resist what is likely to be an increasing crackdown. It's obvious the answer to homelessness is housing and not to strip folks of their vehicles for parking without a permit. However, for those concerned about property values, inflated with a sense of privilege, empowered with outside funding to strike down rent control and to recall progressive council members and to ignore public comments, that makes little difference. So what does this mean? It means you must appear in numbers. I'm talking to the people who are speaking today, as well as any sympathetic members of the Planning Commission. You appear in numbers when tow trucks appear or when police begin sweeping folks off the levee without adequate alternatives, as they did today, March 3rd, to those on the levee, or embarrassing politicians and city bureaucrats who pander to this kind of attack on poor people in whatever forums they frequent. That's how you begin to make some changes here. This, this process is kind of like a, a, a pantomime play when we all give our testimony and we're all ignored. It's a, it's a really serious problem. And of course, I've given you elaborate uh, different kinds of reasons why I, I, I took this to the Coastal Commission in 2016 and I won the appeal. There have not been any other appeals as far as I know, that's why the Maine and Cal Beach closures were actually granted because they never got appeals to the Coastal Commission itself that I heard of. So let's not be misled by staff claims. And I would say it's the community here that has to act, although we are, you know, we're using the, the Planning Commission as an opportunity. And I, I urge the Planning Commission to also show the right, the right face here and do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, I, I just want to say that I do take Mr. Norris's point, and I do want to be clear. We ask you to identify yourself when you speak, but you, you can choose not to do that. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the next caller. Uh, caller, you have three minutes. Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, so my name is Isadora, and I'm a student at UCSC. I'm with the Student Housing Coalition and the YDSA. Um, I actually moved to Santa Cruz recently, so I can really attest to how difficult it is, especially for students to find housing that is actually affordable. Um, and I sympathize a lot with students who can't afford the housing and have to live in their cars. Um, I really think there are better alternatives and better things that could be done with you know, the time of the city, then um, the oversized vehicle ordinance, which really just makes life harder for people who are already struggling. Um, I urge the council not to go forward with the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, yeah, and to just look into alternatives that can be done. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, clerk, um, I'll go have and give one more, um, few more seconds to see if anybody else would like to raise their hand and speak um, before I close the public hearing. It uh, looks like some hands are coming up. So let's go ahead and go to the next speaker, please. Go ahead, speaker, you have three minutes. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my name is Carol Paul Hamas, and I'm on the steering committee of Westside Neighbors. Westside Neighbors was founded in 2019 based on this very issue, which was one city council member's proposal to allow overnight RV parking on uh, Delaware Avenue on the Lower West Side. Uh, Westside Neighbors uh, sent you a, a several page rebuttal, which I'm not sure you had a chance to read, but 
There were five, uh, 796 pages um, in this report, and 500 of them were emails previously received by people, mostly on the Lower West Side, appealing to you to help and the City Council to help us find ways to mitigate the problems that the West Side has experienced with the large number of overnight vehicles parking on city streets. Ironically, we agree with Santa Cruz Cares in uh, this way. We think that people need services. We believe that the overnight vehicle ordinance, if you read the whole thing, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you did, but I'm not sure some of the callers did, we'll see that there is a proposal to provide services for people and to consolidate services in a way that it's most cost effective and also most helpful for county services as well as sanitation services. This is not about criminalizing people. It is about not allowing city neighborhoods to become unsanctioned RV parks, which has created a lot of problems. Um, those are also documented in the staff report from uh, the city staff earlier in, um, in the process of the OVO. We're asking you to deny the appeal. We're asking you to uphold the city council's um, attempt at regulation to help people to move into safe spaces parking we know that the city is coming up with more and more places for people to park, which will be revealed next week. And we're asking you to support the city neighborhoods and the people who uh, need help both with services and with having their city streets not become or not continue to be RV parks without services. Thank you for listening. Good night. Thank you for your comments. We'll go ahead and go to the next caller. Caller, you have three minutes. Hi, um, Lara Filippini here. Um, though I'm involved in many local community organizations, I'm representing only myself and my own views tonight on this subject. I find the many concerns of the local communities experiencing these parked over sized vehicles very compelling, and I think they should be recognized, and they are of real concern. However, I can't find any concern that does not have a corresponding law already in place that I would see as not being implemented adequately or in sometimes actually discriminatorily implemented on certain people unfairly. Um, on top of that, it seems that what the, the city staff is actually putting in front of you, sorry, my cat is making a lot of noise in the background. Um, are a couple of um, justifications, one of which being that um, the oversized vehicle ordinance and issuance of the associated permit does not criminalize the homeless. However, it absolutely creates a ticketing and potential towing structure that is, in fact, the definition of a criminal act in that it is a violation of a local law that has a definable consequence. Um, on top of that, they also say an entire other category of their justification for this um, permit they want to put through is that it doesn't eliminate coastal access. And they give you a whole bunch of examples of, um, you know, local state parks and areas along West Cliff in which you're not allowed to park during certain hours of the night. However, that is for all sized vehicles. What they're doing with this oversized vehicle ordinance is in effect creating a discriminatory act against the people who are dependent on living in their oversized vehicles, but allowing anyone in a normal sized vehicle to park in these locations. I think that there are so many humane issues with this. Um, and I do think that also the people who have issue with um, some of the concerns around the current pattern of where some of these oversized vehicles are collecting, those are real too. We have better solutions and ones that are humane and ones that do not criminalize these people. We need to create avenues of service and working together and recognizing that this is part of our community um, and listening to what they actually have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and do last call and to go ahead and put your hands up and then I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing. Okay, okay, I'm seeing one uh, last call and whatever hands are up uh, after I call last call here, that'll be it. So we're gonna go ahead and go with Lisa is gonna be our last speaker for the public hearing. Um, 
Lisa, go ahead and uh, you'll have three minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Um, so I'm just calling as a local downtown business owner and I'm asking you to uphold the appeal and please reject the oversized vehicle ordinance. Uh, many of our regulars and my personal friends live in vehicles and criminalizing their shelter is simply cruel and discriminatory. Uh, you've heard many clear and compelling points tonight to protect this community, so I really hope that you will listen to them. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and thank everybody in the public for attending and for your comments. And with that, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. And we will bring the item back to the commission for consideration. Um, so, uh, are there any commissioners who would like to make comments? Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Um, I've really struggled with this issue. Um, I think it, it raises a whole host of um, concerns, many of which have been um, presented tonight. I have process concerns as well as substance concerns with the permits before us. Um, I, I am concerned whether the coastal design permits are properly before us and approving permits to carry out an ordinance in the coastal zone that hasn't been approved by the Coastal Commission. I don't think that's the way it's done in the county. Um, and it just seems strange to do that but since staff in the city attorney uh, have assured us, at least I've heard that they've assured us, that this approach is legal and approved by Coastal Commission staff, uh, I guess that's the way it is. I also have concerns about the difference between an ordinance and uh, the permit. Normally, a, the permit carries out an ordinance. And here, it's unclear how much the provisions of the permit are also just the provisions of the ordinance. And from my perspective, it's important to understand the difference between an ordinance and a permit. The, per the ordinance is a law. Um, it contains the regulations that apply, and permits generally implement the law. That's mostly what we do uh, at the Planning Commission when we uh, look at projects that come forward that need various permits. It's a question, our, our, our job is whether they, to the extent we have a job anymore, uh, do they adequately conform to the, count, the city's general plan and zoning ordinance? So it's just a little unusual, I guess, uh, what's happening here in terms of the relationship between the ordinance and the permit. I think it's important to emphasize that what is before us today is not the ordinance. It is the permits that are carrying out the ordinance. And since the council has adopted the ordinance, that's not before us, and concerns about the council's motivation or um, the, whether the ordinance is being adequately carried out, um, I, I don't know whether that's really property before us. I don't think it really is. Um, we, whether we agree with the provisions of the ordinance or not, our job is to determine whether the permits implement the ordinance consistent with its provisions, the general plan, and the zoning ordinance. I think there's a final process concern I have, and it's kind of the tricky situation where the city is both the regulator and the applicant. Um, that's always a little bit uh, difficult in terms of um, the whole issue of is the city biased in its own, um, on its own behalf. And I think it's important that as a commission, we exercise our independent judgment in whatever decision we make. So those are kind of my process concerns. Um, I, I understand that we can move forward and I'm willing to move forward. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about this, the substance, because I think this is really where um, we've really heard a lot of the testimony tonight is around is, is the ordinance and the permits criminalizing behavior? Um, what is the safe parking program, program all about? Let me first say that from my perspective, the all, overall objective of the ordinance seems to me to be to strike a balance between the rights of people living in fixed housing 
and the rights of people living in oversized vehicles. And residents living in safe housing have a right to safe and peaceful neighborhoods. And I don't think public streets are appropriate locations for permanent housing. And oversized vehicles really kind of function as permanent housing. So I have a problem with that notion that somehow people can park their oversized vehicles on the street forever and that's, that's fine because they need to. On the other hand, people living in oversized vehicles have a right to safe, undisturbed places to sleep. And so that's where I, I see the ordinance and the, the theory of the ordinance, the theory of the permit, is to strike this balance and provide for, um, you know, improvement to neighborhood situations, but also um, to allow, to assure that people have the right to have a safe place to sleep. I think the ordinance in, in trying to balance these rights by requiring residents of fixed housing to obtain permits that only for a limited period if they want to park there or they're just uh, oversized vehicles on the street is legitimate. I think prohibiting other oversized vehicles to park on city streets overnight is legitimate, but only if there are safe parking spaces available to them as an alternative. And I think that, for me, that's the crux of the matter, is a lot of the um, testimony, at least as I understand it, is kind of based on the notion that there are places for people to go and, and under this ordinance and these permits, um, the people who don't have a place to go will um, be ticketed and uh, forced to move or forced to move. So I think the objectives of the ordinance are reasonable and I can support them. Unfortunately though, I don't think the conditions of approval for the permits ad adequately carry out these intentions. While a safe parking program is identified, it isn't clearly required. While enforcement of the oversized vehicle parking prohibitions is related to the availability of safe parking places, it isn't clear who can participate in the program. The ordinance speaks to participating in the safe parking programs, but never really defines what this entails. What does it mean for um, participants to register? What are the eligibility requirements? Uh, there are no details provided or, or required, it seems, outlining how the safe parking program is going to work. Overall, then, I don't think the permit, uh, the permits do not provide the assurance that people without fixed housing will only be prohibited from parking their oversized vehicles on city streets overnight if they have a safe parking space available to them. And to my mind, that's what uh, the, the permits need to provide. So. Um, this, despite my concern uh, regarding the process uh, and uh, with the way the permits are before us, I, I am willing to support the permit, but only if uh, some significant changes are made to the um, conditions of approval, because that's where uh, we as a commission have, a, have the ability to condition the implementation of the permits to assure that the requirements or the intention of the ordinance is carried out. Um, at, a, at the appropriate time, I want to make a motion to, to do this. Um, it will take some time and it may make sense for me to uh, share the screen and uh, go through the changes in the ordinance that, I mean, in the, uh, in the conditions of approval that I think need to be uh, adopted in order for um, the, the permits to to adequately carry out the uh, ordinance and uh, protect also neighborhoods and uh, people living in uh, the oversized vehicle. Okay. But I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, you know, cut off other commissioners' uh, comments. So I can wait on making a motion. But when the commission is ready, I will uh, make the motion and uh, share my screen to show the. Um, conditions of approval and the proposed changes I would recommend be made. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. 
Uh, I see uh, Mr. Butler's hand up. Uh, so let's go ahead and hear from Mr. Butler and then we'll bring it back to the commission for any additional comments um, before we swing back to Mr. Schifrin. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Chair Dawson. And thank you, Commissioner Schifrin for that very well thought out um, uh, consideration of where we're at. Um, and yes, it is uh, a odd, uh, situation where we've got the, the coastal permit that are that's implementing the ordinance and um, I wanted to take this opportunity to um, respond to a few of the comments that you said as well as um, clarify some of the things that I heard from the speakers in the public um, uh, first off I think it's important to um, recognize that we do have a requirement in the um, conditions of approval that um, precludes the uh, the uh, enforcement of the no parking between midnight and 5 a.m. for oversized vehicles unless and until at least one safe parking location is in operation. So I'll do a quick um, screen share for you so you can see that. Um, so this is the condition of approval here. And um, this is essentially saying that um, the parking restrictions in the section 10.4120A, that's the midnight to 5 a.m. restrictions, shall not be implemented unless and until at least one safe parking location is in operation. And of course, we have um, identified that if there is not sufficient capacity in the safe parking, but someone is registered for safe parking, but there's not sufficient capacity, then they would not have enforcement occur against them. So they would have a permit um, that they could display and they would have locations where they could go and park on street so that it is not actually criminalizing uh, living in an RV. It is encouraging people to go to the locations, the safe parking locations where they're connected to services, both the services like trash service and the services like um, restroom services, as well as where we can have individuals from our nonprofit service providers in the, the county connect with these individuals and hopefully help them connect to a larger array of social services and ultimately to housing. And that's exactly what the tier three approach is looking to do. That is a 24 seven approach where um, we would have case management services where the city would be paying for direct case management services to really link these individuals to uh, the services that can help them get to um, into permanent housing, which is the goal. I wanted to, um, uh, to point out a few other things here. Um, the, um, there were some comments about the, uh, the city, um, you know, not funding services and the implications associated with that. Um, so, and, and also costs associated with that. So we have funded spaces in the past, for example, at lot 17 um, behind Wheelwork. We um, offered spaces for free to AFC, the Association of Faith Communities who operated that. We also paid for the porta potties, the restroom services and the trash services at that location. And of course, we've recently stood up the pilot program for the uh, tiers one and two, and we're gonna learn from that and we're gonna expand that out as we're learning. Um, I wanted to, to point out um, the, the um, one of the appellants had, had uh, used the, the photograph in uh, the staff report as an example and said, yes, it's clean all around the uh, garbage can. Um, you know, we wanted to focus on the the um, the dumpster because that's you know that was the focus of that point. But um, if you actually see here, this is the same photo just from a different angle. Sorry, the the same picture just from a different angle. Here's the cart that you saw in the other picture. You can see the RVs in the background, which we wanted to show. But if you actually look here, you know there is a, a significant amount of debris that is is right back here. Um, right behind the dumpster. And so it's not just the cost associated with removing the debris. There are significant costs that our, our uh, city incurs for removing other debris surrounding these uses as well. Another, just another example here 
of a trailer with a large amount of debris that is out in the street here that you can see. Um, so I just wanted to point that out that it's, it's not as simple as um, it's just that cost. There are, there are substantial costs that we incur on a regular basis. Um, I did want to also speak to the barriers or safe parking program. We do not have any barriers at this point. You do not have to have registration. You do have to follow some rules. And um, those rules are, you know, some of the basic uh, good neighbor rules that you would expect on, uh, for anyone. You know, there, you, know, you can't black, dump your black water there. You can't throw your trash out. You have to be quiet um, after hours and so forth. Um, the, um, the, the, I wanted to be clear because there were some questions about that in the public comment that the ordinances, um, midnight to 5 a.m. restrictions, those have not gone into effect. And so I just wanted to be clear about that. And the, the, um, there were some comments about the, um, the trash and um, the uh, ordinance provisions related to that. The coastal permit and the design permit are not related to those particular provisions in the ordinance. This is about the coastal access provisions and the safe, uh, safe parking. Um, and then um, I just would like to point out that, you know, this, these, um, these permits, both the coastal permit and design permit would actually facilitate the city's ability to set up a safe parking program inside the coastal zone. And so this would allow for um, parking lots within the coastal zone to be utilized. And one thing that we are um, looking to do is actually have a larger number of locations with a smaller number of vehicles in each one um, so that it isn't a large concentration, but rather um, smaller ones. Um, and then I think finally, I would just point out that um, Commissioner Schifrin's correct. There aren't some of the details with respect to, you know, the registration provisions. Um, we'd be happy to take a look at, at thoughts and ideas that you have surrounding that. Um, but I also would caution the um, commission in not getting too detailed there um, because um, we've got our, our uh, former parking programs manager who's still working with the city just in a different department now on the line here and if needed he can speak to some of the provisions that we have in place related to that registration process but we also want to be flexible right if if we're finding that the registration of going down to the parking office doesn't work then we might want to have some other approach right now um, we have a number that you can call and they provide you instructions on how to um, they get a permit for those facilities but um, I, I want to just maintain that um, that flexibility is really important. We're going to be conducting outreach and engagement with those um, the early adopters, the ones that are that are coming into the program um, uh, initially, so that we can understand, hey, how would we serve you better? Um, what would be an easier approach? And we'll take that um, into consideration as we're morphing um, where the safe parking locations go, what kind of services are provided. We'll hear from the neighbors um, of these programs so that we can help address any of the concerns there. And um, I think that I think that's it. That's a lot. Sorry for taking. Okay. Up. I, I I heard a lot of things that were uh, worth I felt responding to. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll bring it back to commissioners um, for any comment, um, and th and then we can go ahead and consider a motion and then have discussion about that if we would like. So any anybody like to comment before we uh, entertain a motion and then we would have discussion about that motion. Okay, um, looks like maybe we'll go ahead and go back to uh, Commissioner Schiffer. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. You're, you have books and your hand color is exactly the same color as the book. So I always miss it. So <laughs> apologies. Sure, Commissioner Conway, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And I don't want to take a lot of time and I'm um, looking forward to hearing um, Commissioner Schifrin's um, ideas about tightening this up. Um, I do want to thank um, the community members who are providing input. This is a, it is a very difficult process to create a safe parking program. And um, I want to, there's been a lot of people involved in trying to find a reasonable way 
to thread the needle. Um, and uh, this attempt is um, trying to do um, a whole lot of things. I felt like I, I appreciated the feedback and the attention that uh, people were paying to this matter, but I felt like lots of what was missed um, was that this actually is an attempt to move this forward and to create some safe parameters. I have some really big concerns about it also, however, and um, you know, mostly that it, these, it really does need to be low barrier. It needs to not cost, and including the hidden cost of forcing people to drive somewhere in order to get registered. Um, there needs to be plenty of spaces. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think that there is um, some work that we can do to move this forward. Um, I, um, I guess we're, we're not really addressing the appeals at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I'd rather really talk about um, how can we make this better? How can we move this forward? Um, because we clearly have a big problem. Um, and I don't think um, any of us, I can't speak for anybody but myself, but I'm certainly interested in finding um, a way to support people who are living in their vehicles, which is a, an incredibly important um, ability. Um, people who have vehicles are safer um, than being on the street. Um, and I think we can stand up programs that will allow them to be safer and unharassed and have access to just the simple services of living, um, which I know that the city program is trying to do, and also make sure that people are safe. Um, so I really look forward to further discussion um, to try to meet those goals. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and go back to Commissioner Schifrin, and if you'd like to share your screen, I would go ahead and entertain a, a motion, um, and if we get a second, then we can go ahead and have more discussion about it. Okay, we, first, I, I did want to respond to uh, Mr. Butler, because I think um, he did clearly express the intention, which I agree with, of what this program is all about. but. And as part of that, I think you raised the, some of the issues that are of concern, which I feel that, and sometimes you're so close to something, you don't really sort of see its limits. And I think that's really my intent is in, in proposing these um, uh, revisions to the, um, to the uh, uh, conditions of approval is to really really make sure that the intent of the motion is carried, or the intention of the, of the ordinance was carried out. And, and let me just say in terms of one of the issues he raised is a very common issue in the, in the land of regulation, which is, do you want flexibility or do you want certainty? And, um, and you know, the regulators tend to want flexibility, the recipients tend to want certainty. And I think with this issue, we have, uh, as we've seen with the testimony, a good deal of distrust of the city and what its intentions are, what it's actually doing, what its representatives are doing. And in that kind of situation, I think it's better to have certainty, uh, to have more certainty and less flexibility. Um, the conditions of approval allow the city manager to make changes. Um, and I think from my perspective, it's... Um, um, as you'll see, the proposed motion is pretty um, detailed. So can people see the screen? Yeah, if you could make it uh, maybe one page and a little bit bigger so people would have a better chance of seeing the writing. Um, um, I know. Go let, me, let me try to figure out how to do that. All right, let me, okay, uh, I'll. That's a little bit better. Well, I think. it's the same as it was. How's that? Does that uh, work? Yeah, I, I think so. Is, how's that for other commissioners? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, so, I would move that the Planning Commission take the following action. 
approve the staff recommendations regarding the coastal permit and design permit with the following revisions to the conditions of approval. And the changes, the revisions are with underlines and cross out. So I won't read the whole, even though the conditions of approval were only on two pages, I won't read the, what isn't being changed. I'll just read those sections that are being changed or where uh, the motion would, um, it would be to make these changes. So in section number one, um, if one of the following conditions related to the safe parking program is not met with respect to all its terms, the enforcement of the ordinance will not be allowed and the approval of a safe parking program at a specified location may be revoked. So that's really just tying to um, the safe parking program to the enforcement of the ordinance. Uh, then in number three, the, the use shall meet the standards and be, and be developed within the limits established in 2414 um, regarding emissions of noise, odor, smoke, dose, vibration, et cetera. And what's added is mitigation measures may be applied when proposed by staff, safe parking program participants to bring them into compliance. City of Santa Cruz will actively seek funding to provide mobile mechanics to assist participants and needed as needed. So again, these this is speaking to services and responses in terms of trying to assist the um, the clients in um, the, you know in in participating in the program. The major uh, provision of the condition of approval is this condition for the safe parking program. And it was, I didn't think it was very clearly written. So I'm proposing that it be rewritten to say a safe parking program as described in section 1040, 120M of the vehicle and traffic section of the municipal, municipal code shall be implemented by the city and remain in effect for the life of the permit. So this really is saying, in order to have the permit, uh, you need to have a safe parking program. Site location shall be in the city of Santa Cruz and will include basic sanitation services at a minimum, portable toilet, hand washing stations, trash containers, and detailed information will be provided uh, with an up-to-date list of options for sanitation and black water dumping. City of Santa Cruz will actively seek funding to provide vouchers for black water dumping and fuel to offset costs for relocation and waste management for participants in the safe parking program. And so again, um, requiring not just the intention to provide services, but really um, putting that services be provided. Um, and these uh, off-street locations, changing the hours from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, and then, um, again, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., uh, 8 a.m. And then under four, the, there will be no cost to participants in the state parking program. That's in the conditions. And then the new, new sections are the prohibitions of section 10.40.120A, which prohibits the overnight parking, shall not be applied to any person and oversized vehicle collectively that does not have free and unrestricted access to, safe, uh, to a safe parking program, parking space, and there shall be no registration or eligibility requirements to participate in the program. It was very confusing. Um, there was no description of what, uh, there was a, a reference to registration. There was no description of what the registration would entail, what kind of eligibility would be required. And I think if it's, if it's going to be uh, available to people living in their uh, uh, oversized vehicles, it needs to be without barriers. And I think others have talked about it being without barriers. And then uh, there's an added condition and operations and management plan for the safe parking program shall be approved by the zoning administrator within three months from the effective date of the permit and shall contain the following. So as other kind of uses to carry out projects, 
there needs to be a management plan that's available, that's approved by the ZA, and that's available to the public so that there are details of how the program is going to operate. And it's not simply um, decisions at the staff level that for all the best intentions in the world may not be clear uh, to people. Proceed procedures for informing law enforcement. So the provisions of uh, part of the plan would include for procedures for informing law enforcement personnel in real time of the availability of safe parking program parking spaces. And this procedure shall be in place prior to enforcement of the ordinance. There should be procedures to ensure that potential participants of the safe parking program will confront no barriers to their participation. And there should be details regarding the funding and management of the safe parking program. I think these are all things that, this, that we've heard that the city is intending to do, but I think it's legitimate given the importance of the program and the controversy around the program that um, they all be made very clear. Um, the parking restrictions contained in Again, the prohibition shall not be implemented until and unless a safe parking space is available. If all available safe parking spaces are filled, the non-permit parking restriction shall not be enforced. And I think this is sort of critical uh, in terms of the to the in terms of the good intention of the city, because the as the as the, Mr. Butler said, the ordinance says the the, the the um, the enforcement can occur unless there is at least one safe parking space. Well, that I think is insufficient. There needs to be a nexus between the availability of spaces and the enforcement of the ordinance. Otherwise, um, there are going to be people who are it's enforced against where there may not just may not be enough spaces, which according to the testimony is not that unlikely. Uh, if a vehicle cannot relocate to a safe, safe parking location due to a mechanical issue of a lack of fuel or physical, uh, physical, mental, or emotional difficulties of the vehicle operator that prevents safe operation of the vehicle, the parking restrictions will not be enforced for up to 72 hours and the right to sleep at the current location will be observed. The city shall notify the occupant of any resources available to assist and remedying whatever is preventing them from moving their vehicle to a safe parking spot. So my motion is to uh, approve the permits with the uh, revision to the conditions as, out, as, as, out, as I've just outlined. So that's the motion. I don't know if there's somebody who's willing to second it, but that's what I'm making as my motion. Moving yeah. second that. Looks like Commissioner uh, Maxwell has seconded. So we have a motion on the floor from Commissioner Schifrin and second by uh, Commissioner Maxwell. And we'll go ahead and open discussion. I see um, Ms. Bronson's hand. Uh, go ahead. Hey, I'll introduce myself. Um, I work in the city attorney's office and so nice to be here with all of you. I'm an attorney in the city attorney's office. I was wondering, I've never seen this document. I was wondering if it might be possible uh, to email me a copy of the document and maybe take a brief recess so that I can review and make sure that it's legally appropriate. Um, it's, it's pretty long and it's a little surprising to get something so long to have to review on the spot. Um, it, I don't know if that would be possible or appropriate or how, or how you all would feel about it. But. I'm happy to do it. What is your uh, email address? Sure. Um, it's to C. Bronson at abc-law.com. At abc-law? Yes. Um, okay, while you're doing that, um, I see Commissioner Kennedy's hand. And uh, let's get uh, some feedback from other commissioners, and then we'll consider um, a recess, perhaps. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, go ahead. Well, I was just, can we get it by email too? It's the first time I've seen it as well, so I'm feeling kind of like I need to digest it a bit. Yeah. So, and so I guess, like, I want to ask: Is this the first time staff has seen that at all? Well, you know, I have been told by staff 
Well, there are two problems with not being able to send my thoughts to people before the meeting or even at the start of the meeting. Um, I've been told that it's a violation of the Brown Act for me to send anything to anybody. Uh, I tell a majority of the commissioners uh, before the meeting. It um, certainly the, is. The other issue is I didn't, you know, I've been thinking about this ordinance, but I didn't want to present a, a final motion until I heard from public testimony because it really didn't seem legitimate to, um, you know, sort of circumvent that testimony and not allow that to also affect um, the, you know, the motion itself. So, um, let me see. Probably the best way if you have that, uh, email it, but I can upload it to the website, the public can have access to it, and then I can send it. Let me go ahead and, and do that. that. Okay, so I've sent it to uh, the attorney and to you, Tess, and let me know if you get it. And so j just to be clear, we um, and I might need a little direction from staff here. So, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, I think there's also the potential to continue the item if, if we're going to need more time to consider it. Um, and then there's also the potential for us to take a 15 minute recess. So um, is, is that something commissioners would support? Uh, it looks like it's about 9.09, 9.10 now. Uh, we could take a 15 minute research, um, recess. Um, is, am I seeing nods mostly from commissioners? Would that? I, I would prefer to act on it tonight if possible. Um, okay. I don't okay. know I um, whether the attorney has received my email and whether Tess has received the email. I want to make sure you've gotten it. Okay, okay. she's okay. gotten it. That yeah, means got it probably it that. And, and, and Tess, will, uh, Tess um, how long would it take for you to get it up on the website for folks to be able to to look at it as well, the public be able to look at it. Moments. Okay, moments. Okay, so so why don't we go ahead and it is nine ten by my watch. Um, why don't we go ahead and take a recess and we will return at uh, nine twenty five. So we will go into recess. Uh, let me go ahead and call in Commissioner Greenberg before we go into recess. Go ahead, Commissioner Greenberg. Okay, you have your thank hand. You. Thank you, Chair Dawson. I was just curious. So we're get, we would go into recess, and then um, we all would have a chance to review this. And you're saying the public would have a chance to review this, um, well, and there would be additional comment, or what do you? Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I don't think that we would reopen. The, I don't think there's a requirement to reopen the public hearing. Staff uh, would would since the public hearing is closed. It, it would just go back to the commission to act on the motion. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, right. So um, I, I, I think it is important though that, that the public can at least view what we're acting on. So um, again, right. this, this is the, um, this is what we have been in consideration for this meeting, right? To, to issue the permits or to not issue the permits. And this is the condition of approval associated with that action. Um, so uh, we will go into recess for 15 minutes. We will come back at 925. And then commissioners will have a chance to further deliberate. And then we will go ahead and vote on this motion. Um, is everybody clear on that? Okay, I will go ahead and call the um, the meeting into motion uh, into recess, and we will return at nine twenty five.
Do you want me to put it up back up? Yeah, we could we we could go. Well, let's hold off on that for a second. If it's another commissioner request that we can do that, and we can talk through specific specific. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just officially call us back into session here, uh, the March for, uh, third, uh, city of Santa Cruz planning commission meeting back in session at nine 26 or so. And, uh, we have a motion before us to approve the coastal development permit and the design permit to implement the oversized vehicle ordinance with um with changes proposed changes to the conditions of approval so we'll go ahead and bring it back to commissioners hopefully you had a time uh it wasn't very long but there there were some substantive changes proposed so does anybody want to um have any comments or questions before we go to a vote um i I have some comments, but I'll, I'll, I'll be last in line. So uh, looks like I think uh, Commissioner Conway and then Commissioner Kennedy. Okay, um, thank you. And um, Commissioner Schifrin, thank you for um, providing this. I think it is um, helpful. And of course, we're a little bit on the fly. Um, I generally agree with um, the clarifications. I feel like you you are not you've not in making this motion. You're not um, redoing or undoing the work that staff and the many uh, people that have participated in this. But it's mostly clarification. Um, I'd like to clarify that as to the no barriers. <clears throat> I certainly agree that there shouldn't be barriers to participating. However, the expectation that um, participants in safe parking programs will follow um, reasonable rules that have been developed um, by the operator are important. Um, that's one comment. And the other one is on number six, you're suggesting that there could be a set of reasons why a vehicle can't relocate. I appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, but um, the occupant will also um, need to um, follow all of the other laws on the books. Maybe it goes without saying, no black water discharge, trash, um, and you know the disruptive uh, behavior. Um, those were those were my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Go ahead, Commissioner Kennedy. Oh, let me lower my hand. I, I'm just working through them. Give me another minute. We're going to hear from staff back on legality at some point here, too. Uh, yes, uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Bronson would like to chime in, and then we can go uh, to Mr. Butler. Uh, Ms. Bronson. Okay, so we've had a, I've had a few minutes to look over it, and I don't haven't gotten through the whole thing. Um, just, I'm just sort of looking at it in terms of uh, clarity of language, making sure that we're not having any un un unintended consequences, and also to make sure that everything is within uh, your purview as a planning commission. Um, one change I think you might consider is in the paragraph one. Um, the under underlined in black, it says the enforcement of the ordinance will not be allowed. And uh, you might consider changing that to the enforcement of section 10.40.12a to just clarify that it's that one section of the ordinance that has to deal with the no overnight parking rule. I think that's what's intended, but um, that's um, something that you might consider. There's also uh, like uh, wait, okay. you know, as a maker of the motion, let me just, I mean, I'm flexible um, and I'm willing to make that change um, as a friendly amendment to the motion to uh, specify the section. I think that's a good uh, suggestion. I'm trying to see uh, where in the I'll go ahead and second that. Do, do I need to second 
your well no we just have to ask the the person who seconded if it's okay with him okay. as well and not okay time. okay great thank you and um and I think that same change could be made in other places as well, where it talks about the ordinance. Um, let's see in the in one of the bullet points here. Um, I tried to put in the code sections, but yeah. I, guess I failed. <laughs> um, so where where are we? Um, in the um. So if we look at number five, if we go one, two, three, the fourth bullet point ahead of that, um, it also says sort of the ordinance. I might suggest replacing that with a, a reference to the code again, 10.40.120A. Um, That's acceptable to me. Is it acceptable to the maker of the, the second of the motion? Okay. Um, if, if we're talking about that specific provision, Chair, would it be okay if I, I chimed in um, and asked our attorney about uh, our approach here? Uh, let's go ahead and get through the attorney's comments and then we can ask okay. questions. So um, why don't you go ahead and finish Ms. Bronson and then we will go to Mr. Butler after we uh, make it through your comments. Okay. And then that, just that same comment once again in paragraph number five, um, the last sentence, um, it says, if all safe parking spaces are filled, and I might suggest you write then, you know, section 10.40.120A 120A shall not be enforced. And just as, again, as a point of clarity. And that's you know, acceptable to me if it's acceptable to the second. The second it is. Okay. Yeah, that's and a good clarification. I couldn't come up with a good language here. <laughs> and then I think maybe now it's maybe Lee. I think Lee has a number of sort of policy. Um, there are a number of issues that are maybe legal, maybe policy, and that Lee and I talked about during the break. So I'll let him take it from here. Thanks, Kathy. And um, uh, I think the first one. Before you one, lock in, Mr. Okay, yeah, good. just. Um, so, so um, I just want to encourage Ms. Bronson to chime in, and, and it would be very important, I think, to the commissioners to understand the points of policy where there may be concerns and the points of law where there may be concerns. So um, it would be very good to get a lot of clarity around that um, because those can be hard to parse. So um, please, as much as we can, can we make those clarifications through the comments? Thank you. Um, the first one that I would like to point out is the um, the hours. Um, uh, I actually uh, I, I think that the hours there are uh, the changes to the hours are problematic. We we um, had some really um, detailed conversations with the Coastal Commission staff about those about how the safe parking programs can be um, designed in a manner to not limit um, public access. And so when we're putting the, um, the program in place, we're essentially saying that those individuals can park in this location during those hours. And the Coastal Commission was concerned about having those hours too early. And so if they're at starting at 6 p.m. rather than 8 p.m., they were concerned that the uh, visitors to the coast may um, have access precluded by these safe parking programs. Um, and the, the Coastal Commission also did not support um, the staff, I should say. I, I want to be clear that this is the staff um, that we're talking with, not the commission itself. But the commission staff did not support 24-7 um, facilities in the coastal zone. Um, you know, I, I think in thinking through it, in theory, you know, there could be some private lot where that could be the case, and, and we could wordsmith this such that, that, that a private lot would be allowed, but we were specifically talking and, and anticipating that these would be in, in pub, on public properties and um, you know, public lots, and the Coastal Commission did not want that 24-7 um, uh, program um, in a place where it's going to take up um, and potentially prohibit public access in 
uh, or limit public access in the coastal zone. That was one of the comments that- so, uh, Can I follow yeah, up please, on yeah, that with you? Um, so some of these safe parking spaces are going to be in the coastal zone. Some of them may not be in the coastal zone. Uh, would there be any problem sort of differentiating uh, as it kind of does in the, um, uh, in the conditions where we would say within the coastal zone, um, it would be 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. to, uh, to 8 a.m., but outside of the coastal zone, they could be from 6 p.m. PM to 8 a.m. Yeah, there, there's, there's no issue with that. Um, and the, the, um, the only concern is that, um, you know, some locations that might um, be more challenging. If, for example, it's a location where um, office workers or retail workers um, are using that location, um, you know, the 6 p.m. stop uh, could be more challenging. Um, so, I, again, this is, <laughs> you, you talked eloquently, Commissioner Schifrin, about that, that balance between, um, you know, certainty and flexibility. And this is one where, you know, providing that flexibility, I think, is important um, because um, a different one, one site might be fine at 6 p.m. Um, and another might, might not be. I, I'm, I hear what you're saying, and I, so it's, it's kind of in the interest of trying to maximize the number of state parking locations. Uh, it may give more ability to, um, to, have, to have the later date. I wonder um, if it would say no later than 8 p.m., uh, and then that would give you the flexibility if you could have it earlier in some other places, it could work. Um, I'd be willing to support that. How does that sound to you? Um, I, I think um, two things. One, I think if we had something like um, would strive to um, be um, open as early as possible near 6 a.m., but may, or sorry, 6 p.m., but um, may be adjusted on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I might ask at this point, um, Brian Borguno, our, our former uh, parking manager now working in our economic development department, but just maybe if, if he has a, a um, perspective on whether or not, um, you know, eight, it, you know, sometimes is, is there a lot, for example, where we would say, hey, you know, this is heavily utilized until 9 p.m., for example. And so on this one, maybe we did nine to eight. And again, I just want to reiterate for the commission and for the public that we're actually looking to do these in a lot of different places, small numbers in a lot of places. Um, and so um, if, it, if it's okay, Brian, maybe any, any issues with a, a later start time in some locations? I, I guess a point of clarification, this is a coastal permit for coastal locations. I would want to make sure that I understand that it is the intent then to mandate what's happening outside of the coast do that provision and how we program locations versus in the coast? That's a great question, Brian. Um, <laughs> well, there's also a design permit. So I, yeah. I don't know. That was one of the confusing things is the yeah. design permit is both in the coastal zone and outside of the coastal yeah. zone. <laughs> so, so what provision applies to the design permit? What provision applies to the coastal permit? I leave it up to you to figure that one out. So, so that's my first question. The second part of that is I think, you know, the hours that we had proposed, again, we're in, in coordination with Coastal Commission staff, um, and there is problematic conflict with availability uh, the earlier we go in the day at a lot of the locations that we are attempting to stand up uh, early on in this program, but that may not always be the case. So the more flexibility we have on not mandating a time start, uh, the more opportunity we have to stand up more locations. Well, the, the proposed, uh, I'm kind of convinced, I don't know about the second, but I'm kind of convinced that we, you know, the original conditions of approval were for 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, the, as I remember, the additional operational criteria may be applied by the city manager. I would say that that would give you the flexibility that maybe you're asking for. But again, trying to find the balance between certainty and um, clarity 
uh, and flexibility. Um, I'm willing to go back to the to go back to the original time based on the Coastal Commission. I don't, to the extent that if the permit is approved, um, that it has. If we approve it tonight, if there is a vote to approve this, and uh, there's support from the Coastal Commission staff, that's going to be desirable in terms of the ability to move forward with the permit. So, if it's okay with the second, uh, I would um, go back to having the hours from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Is that okay with the second, Commissioner Mack? That's okay with me. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, there's two places where that is located, I guess, in that. Yeah, and Commissioner Shippen, you can feel free to share your screen if you, since you're making live changes, and that might help the other commissioners kind of track as, as we move through these. Okay, um, share. I, I think um, we can go ahead to Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, thanks, Chair. So I really do appreciate the intent here of kind of doing some fine tuning, and I think some of these ideas are good. Um, I did work through the bullets. So before I work through those, just to set the table here, I'm coming in, the, in at the end of a very long process here, and my concern is kind of upsetting balances that have been worked out through committees and all these you know, different things that have happened over the years. So at least from my perspective, changing things like eight to six, I don't know, that might have a big difference for a neighbor, you know, the two hours. So I'm just a little bit nervous about running in here and moving things around. So I don't think you need my vote to pass this probably. Um, if you do, I'm fine with number one and number four. Those are great. Good clarifications. I have some reservations about number three. You know, is mobile mechanic a thing? Or is this like just adding extra cost to the city where there's no budget? Um, similarly, like, okay, so where I draw the line is number six just to me feels like it's way over the line. You know, it seems to accommodate mental, emotional difficulties, all these different things. It just seems like that would be very hard to implement. So I'm not in favor of number six in any way. And then number four, like, I don't know, it's just getting so specific with all those additional bullet points. So um, I could go with one and three and with love and compassion to our houseless members of our community, truly, I want to bring the focus back to Carol and the neighbors and, you know, all that the neighbors have gone through through this process and um, re-emphasize that this is a balancing and a good place to start and we should just do it. Let's, let, let's deny the appeal, run it out there. Staff is great at adjusting, getting new data. So um, that's where I'm at with the whole thing. Um, so just to recap, like, yeah, condition changes one and four, no sweat. For me, three, the mobile mechanics is too much. And then um, four is just too much detail on the bullets for a condition, in my opinion. And then six is like, oh, man, mental and emotional difficulties, that's really hard for us to develop effective policies around. So that's where I'm at with this. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make my comments. Um, and then um, looks like Mr. Well, Butler. Can I ask if uh, uh, Lee is done? He was going through the... Was that the only concerns you had? Uh, it's it's not. I've got a series of other comments if the commission would be interested in hearing. Okay. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and run through those. Uh, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Chair Dawson. Um, so, uh, Chair Schifrin, or excuse me, Commissioner Schifrin, you've got the um, the uh, the number four there, if you scroll down to the bullet that begins in the prohibitions. Okay. Right here. Yeah. I think that is wholly redundant with the um, condition number five. And so I don't think that that is necessary. You can, you can take a look at the two and see.
the difference has to do with uh, um, registration and um, so that eligibility requirements. I, I kind of almost, prefer, I mean, it, you're right, it is somewhat redundant, um, but it was a matter of mucking. Most of number five um, is taken from the conditions of um, that were that were less clear. Unfortunately, I didn't cross out all that was there. Um, and with I think this is kind of a timing one as well. Um, it's well, I guess I'm, as I'm thinking about, it, I think they are different. The prohibitions one says they're not going to be applied to any person that doesn't have a free and unrestricted access to a parking space and there shall be no registration or eligibility requirement. Number five says the, the prohibition shall not be implemented until a safe space is available. And if they're all taken, then it won't be enforced. So it really just emphasizes that point. Right, and um, with respect to your um, your comments about the barriers, I think that's better handled in, you have a specific bullet related to that, um, a couple further down, where it talks about procedures um, uh, where there's no barriers to participation. Um, and I, I would think that um, you, know, you may want to, as um, Commissioner Conway suggested, you may want to um, tighten that language a little bit uh, with respect to, as Commissioner Conway was saying, that there are some rules that need to be followed with respect to, um, you know, good neighbor policies, right? Um, and you know, you can't you can't be disruptive, um, and and so forth. But I think that 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 um, can be um, that some of those uh, registration. Um, criteria can be added to the um, barrier bullet below and still be covered by number five and have everything else covered by number five. So, so Mr. Butler, um, if I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, it, it seems, well, I'm just trying to facilitate moving this along here. So, um, Chair, Chair Differin, you, you want to keep the sections that Mr. Butler has brought up, and then um, we can go on to... I do, show. but I think the, I, I'm trying to come up with some language about rules, because I think, you know, reasonable rules are, <clears throat> should be followed. Um, how, do you have some language that you would suggest? Um, the, yeah, let, let, let me work on that I, and, and or, oh, go ahead, Mr. Butler. Yeah, I could also I could also work on some language also in a moment. Um, it, it was just, that was one of the things that, that jumped up to me. Um, and um, then uh, just down from there, the procedures for informing law enforcement personnel in real time. Um, I know that there have been a number of potential uh, considerations for how this will be enforced um, and um, how it will roll out. Um, I, I might invite Brian Borguno up again. I know that you know the display of a permit, for example. So we we provide a permit that um, can be displayed in a window when someone goes to a safe parking location, and then if that is full, then they could also display that permit at uh, various locations to park on street as well. Um, is that how that's anticipated to occur, Brian? Uh, at this time, that's how it's anticipated to occur. We also are exploring how we are going to manage data collection of availability and what potential applications can be used, but that has not been vetted to a point that we have a a solution for that at this point. So I would just ask you, Brian, um, the way this condition is worded, do you see any um, concerns with respect to implementation? At this time, I'd say yes, 
Um, not that that's insurmountable, but I don't think that we would be ready to launch a real-time availability program. Um, you know, right now we're relying on our police officers as, you know, participants in hosting some of the emergency parking and safe places and coordinating with staff. Um, you know, the intent is for them to have as, as much of information as possible as they're doing that enforcement and have the ability to check on it. But when it states, you know, real-time availability, um, you know, they might only be getting that the day before and, um, you know, making their judgment calls in the field as they're doing enforcement. And if they're unsure, um, I would defer to their expertise to not be enforcing if they don't have the information of availability. I think that's the concern that, you know, how will the law enforcement people at, you know, at midnight know where there are safe parking places? And if the program's going to work, they really need to know that. I mean, otherwise, how can they tell somebody to, that they need to go to a safe parking space if they don't know if there's a safe parking space available? People could be just driving around trying to find a place to park for the night. Um, yeah, um, I, I just want to chime in here. Um, that there are very affordable technological solutions for real-time availability it, it's just something that has to be committed to um so i um i appreciate the information that that isn't part of the program now but i think part of the idea for the conditions of approval is to help guide the oper like operationalizing some of these aspirations Um, okay, let's, um, looks like lots of commissioners have their hands up. Um, I, I, I will save my comments to the end. Um, Mr. Butler, do you have anything else you'd like to work through with Chair Schifrin before we go to uh, Commissioner Masidi Miller? I saw, saw Commissioner Conway, Commissioner Greenberg. So uh, let's go ahead and finish working through your concerns and then move it to the commissioners. Yeah, and um, would you like me to go through all of mine, or would you like commissioners to comment on the specific ones that, if we're already on that topic? I'll leave that to you, Chair Dawson. Yeah, let's 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 go ahead and start taking comments at uh, at each of these points, and so we're not all having to remember the four or five points before. So if if, if people have comments specific to uh, uh, the section we're working through now. Go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to go ahead and put my hand down. Um, Commissioner Masidi Miller, uh, go ahead and uh, make your comment. Yeah, I, I'm not sure um, my comments are related to the specific sections under consideration right now. I'm I'm feeling a bit uneasy with the process that we're uh, going through tonight, um, and I'm. I'm feeling a, a little bit like um, uh, Commissioner Kennedy was expressing earlier. We are we're sort of you know dabbling with something that was obviously developed uh, with, in close cooperation with other agencies, you know, outside the city, uh, multiple departments within the city. Um, it's it's a bit like a, a puzzle. Uh, this. Um, Permit and development of the permit and the conditions of permit, and I'm I'm concerned that as we tamper with this, we're going to make a program uh, unworkable um, with with insufficient flexibility to meet uh, uh, situations that have not been fully flushed out. And uh, I think it would be wise for us to um, you know think carefully about changing things too much. You know, a word or two here or there, or maybe an extra condition. You know, you can kind of live with sort of the mission of Kennedy. You know, I can I can deal with one, I can deal with three, but you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. I you know, it's just too much. And I, I think I think if we're going to wholesale, you know, rewrite this thing, um, I think it would be prudent uh, for us to uh, uh, push this back to staff. Uh, and ask them to take a fresh look at this and bring it back to us uh, after they've had a chance to look through these things, coordinate with other agencies, coordinate with other departments, and give us a holistic um, response to this kind of a, you know big rewrite of the conditions of approval. So 
Um, if we're going to continue this way, it will, it'll be difficult for me to support this. Um, and I think that's the extent of my comments right now. Thank you. Before we go on, could I um, uh, respond to a concern raised by Mr. Butler around the prohibition uh, bullet and uh, ask, uh, I'm willing to add the sentence, reasonable rules of behavior may be applied. Um, is that responding to your concerns about, uh, concerns about the rules? Um, yes, I think that um, might actually be um, better in the, um, the uh, barriers bullet that you have to down below to speak to Commissioner Conway's earlier concern. So that's number five? Uh, right, no, uh, right there, right, uh, yes, right in the middle there. Okay, okay. Is that, um, it, is I, that I'm change? willing to add, add that if it's uh, acceptable to the second. Uh, Commissioner Maxwell, you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's acceptable for me. Okay. Mr. Butler. Um, so uh, let's see. I do have on that prior section um, some potential language where the prohibitions one, if, if the, uh, the commission is interested in that. Uh, well, I'd like to hear what you uh, would propose. Here's a, uh, I'll pull up a draft here. If you could, um, or would you prefer I read it? I could, I could. Yeah, I, uh, are, are you stop sharing? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing screen and you can uh, bring up your screen, Mr. Butler. Okay, let's try this. Um, okay, so prohibitions in section, this is the midnight to 5 a.m. prohibition. The prohibitions in that section shall not be applied to any person and oversized vehicle collectively that does not have free access to a low or no barrier safe parking program space. So the unrestricted speaks to the, um, you know, they are restricted from dumping black water or from, um, uh, you know, uh, having disruptive behavior or throwing trash and so forth. Uh, so that, that was part of the uh, consideration there. Uh, I'm frankly, I'm concerned about low um, and what that might mean. Um, and I think it's more, it's not like there wouldn't be rules. I think the intent with this was that there'd be no barrier to participation. And so I'm, I guess I'm not comfortable with that change as, as I'm reading it. I just wanted to put something out there as an option, and, and it looks like Chair Dawson wanted to comment. Yeah, and and uh, since we're on this bullet, and um, Mr. Butler, if you could stop sharing your screen, sure. and Chair Schiffer, and you could go ahead and uh, share your screen back. Um, I I I think that um, I would like to offer a friendly amendment around. The, the reasonable word, um, I think kind of a more common term with, with uh, could be a, like good neighbor. Um, I, I, I do worry that something like reasonable could include things like alcohol use or things like that that are reasonable to some people and not reasonable to other, and that would create a barrier to participation. So, Good neighbor rules usually are around um, things that Commissioner Conway mentioned, noise and hoarding and, you know, trash. And, of course, all the existing rules around 
uh, pollution and those kind of things. So I, I would like to offer a friendly amendment instead of reasonable that you use the word good neighbor. Um, a good neighbor agreement would be, you know, part of uh, good neighbor agree. Uh, good neighbor rules of behavior may be applied. Uh, something like that. So I would like to offer that as a friendly amendment. Unless Sam has an objection to that, um, it's fine by me. Um, is it okay with the second? Yes. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Conway, again, your your hand is <laughs> camouflage, but I, I see you. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple of comments, and um, one of them is the I was fine with Mr. Butler's language of no and low barriers. I can definitely imagine, and in my experience, I believe this would be um, desirable that there would be um, in various locations that some of them might be specifically targeted to families with children um, or transition age youth or some particular population. I would consider that a low barrier. I mean, maybe we would define it differently. Um, but that an absolute no barrier besides following the rules might be appropriate. And um, but I think that this does uh, make me think um, really in support of what Commissioners Kennedy and Ms. C.D. Miller are suggesting, which is um, these clarifications are helpful, and I'm glad that we're going through them, um, but they are complex, and I feel like... Um, They'll, they're going to need to be vetted um, in in one way or another, whether it's after the planning commission moves them on and before they go to council, um, or in returning to the planning commission. Um, I definitely agree with Commissioner Schifrin that we want to get this moving. It needs to get moving, but um, if to me it seems like it may be expedited best by returning, um, having it uh, worked on chewed over by all the parties that be and return to um, the Planning Commission as soon as is reasonable. Okay, thank you for, yeah, thank you for your comments. Um, Mr. Butler, do you have additional sections that you would like to work through before we go to a vote on accepting the permits with uh, the proposed conditions of approval? I would like to look at number six. Um, and I know there were some concerns that some commissioners expressed regarding this. Um, I wanted to point out just in, so in case the commissioners had not seen it, there is a provision in the ordinance itself that um, speaks to this, um, but it's, it's not as broad as this. And so I just wanted to point that out um, and I'll read that for you so that you're aware. It says the prohibitions contained in subsection A, which is the midnight to 5 a.m. Would you uh, give the reference to the or, uh, section of the order? Sure. This, is, this is section uh, G, uh, so 10.40.120G. And I'm happy to share my screen if that would be helpful. Z? G. And then um, under number. Three. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lee. G is in guy or yes. That's uh, okay. Yeah. So under um, number three, there it says um, oversized vehicles involved in an emergency or being repaired under emergency conditions. So the uh, midnight to 5 a.m. Uh, parking prohibition doesn't apply to that. And if this, if, but I want to be clear because it's not as it's not as broad as what Commissioner Schifrin has posted here. It says emergency parking may be allowed for 24 consecutive hours where an oversized vehicle is left standing at the roadside because of mechanical breakdown or because of the driver's physical incapacity to proceed. So the ordinance speaks to that in, in uh, physical incapacity and mechanical issues, um, but provides the 24 hours. So this would actually be providing more than the ordinance.
Okay, um, thank you for that clarification. So um, I did wanna make a few comments before I bring this to a vote. Um, just generally. But I'm not um, sure, is, is uh, Mr. Butler done? Is that the last of your uh, Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> I think we could do a lot of words here, <laughs> to be honest, but I, I think those, those are the big ones uh, that, uh, that jumped out to me that thought might be of interest to the commission. Okay, thank you uh, for going through that. Um, I'll go ahead and um, uh, save my comments to that clean up here. So, uh, Commissioner Greenberg, did I see your hand or did, no? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Commissioner Greenberg and then Commissioner Musidi Miller. Um, then I'll make a brief comment and then we'll go ahead and take it to a vote unless somebody else's hand comes up. So, Commissioner Greenberg. Thanks so much. And I, I you know, I really appreciate everyone's efforts around this. My understanding is the spirit of this really is that we want to balance um, the different sides that, that we've been hearing and that we we want to, um, you know, uh, perhaps um, expedite a process that will achieve the, ma the maximum that, that the different sides are interested in and in terms of um, the, the folks in the vehicles that includes this recognition that I think the appellants and, and a lot of the people in the public were, were mentioning having to do largely with um, the impractical, the, the, you know, that this is not a really um, practical, uh, humane policy insofar as there really aren't sufficient spaces available. Um, and, you know, the 10% of the spaces relative to the number of people in the vehicles and so forth. And that this effort is really to ensure that it won't be implemented unless those spaces are indeed available. And in fact, um, speaking also to the concerns of, of neighbors and others, as well as to, to folks in the vehicles, that services are available in those sites, in these safe parking sites. And so like there's this effort to really ensure that the material reality is, is in place in order to make this practicable and humane um, and you know, something that is sustainable to some degree. Um, so I, that's the way I'm understanding this effort and that, you know, it could go through a whole other process uh, that might take longer and that this might achieve the maximum of the needs of both sides. And so that's, I'm, I'm trying to see the, the best in, in this and in that regard. And I really appreciate all the effort that went into this in that, in that way. And I realize we're trying to like get through this as quickly as we can and that's some new information. Um, I had, um, a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, I, and you know, I, you'll tell me how um, you think about this. But um, in terms of the good neighbor rules, this last point, um, I'm wondering, um, and and also the the point about procedures to ensure that potential participants in the safe parking program will confront no barriers to their participation. I'm wondering about the kind of process you know, what these procedures are and the degree to which, you know, given what I've been hearing some folks saying, that if there are complaints about the implementation of this, you know, there were some suggestions from the public that there be some kind of dialogue involved um, and that there be a, you know, that some, kind of, um, some kind of process where there's a collective um, establishment of what these procedures would be or that there's a process for, for um, filing complaints, if, if people feel that they're not being treated fairly and so forth. I'm wondering if, if that needs to be here or what, what's the thinking there, in addition to which, uh, how the good neighbor rules and so forth, um, and the limits to those um, and what they include, what they don't include would be established. Um, if in fact the, the goal is for, uh, you know, some kind of, um, rather than flexibility, some kind of, um, some kind of clarity or you know finite definition of, of what we're talking about here. So there's a question about the procedure and the degree to which the different sides will be included. Um, and then the, I don't know how significant this is, but the, the mention of um, City of Santa Cruz will actively seek funding um, that's mentioned a couple of times. I'm curious what the, what's meant there and what happens if that funding is not found or you know what the, Significance of the actively seeking funding is in, in putting that in the, in the 
document here. Um, those were two of my questions, really. How the process, questions of complaints in terms of how this is being implemented, um, that there's really procedures to hear on the different sides, um, as well as the question about, um, you know, that this can still be implemented and that the major point, which is that if the, if the spaces are not available, um, that this can't, that, that uh, people are uh, able to stay where they are, um, not be contingent on the funding uh, not being found and so forth. So that, that question um, is just whether that, that might be interpreted in, in some kind of different way, the question of seeking funding. So those are the yeah. five. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just uh, one quick comment um, before I send it to you, Commissioner Schiffman. I'll just um, uh, so the the I, I guess this is kind of to add on to Commissioner Greenberg's question. The the way that I read the actively seek funding is it is to provide additional services other than the safe parking program. Um, that could help provide a broader range of services. It, so it doesn't, to me, seem related to um, the, the safe parking program happening or not. So maybe you could just clarify that in addition, um, because it seems like it's, it's for something like a mobile mechanic to actually help with repairs or fuel vouchers to actually offset some of the costs. But it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't prevent people from accessing the program necessarily. So. Go ahead, Commissioner Schiffer. Thanks. Um, I would say that in terms of the actively seeking funding, from my perspective, those are aspirational. Um, they are, you know, essentially identify them, identifying uh, objectives that would be nice to achieve if there was funding available uh, to provide additional services to people. As um, you know, Chair Dawson says, it doesn't really affect the basic requirements of the program. The, the, the other question you raised, I think is a really, you know, it, it's sort of, in a sense, that's the intention of the operations and management plan, mm. um, that that's going to lay out a procedure. And um, I guess it would make, it would, it would, uh, you know, I'd be willing to add another component or another um, bullet that that plan would include procedures for, um, for uh, filing and resolving complaints, uh, because I think that would be a desirable thing to do. So is that the kind of thing you had in mind? Yeah, I'm getting the sense that there is concern that, um, that there be some process for adjudicating, you know, when there's uh, a feeling that proper procedures are not being followed. And so, thank you. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I'd be happy to add that as a friendly amendment if it's okay with the second. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, and, and could you clarify? of what you're adding, Chair Schifrin, just so the other commissioners are clear? Um, I, I'm not sharing my screen. I just I typed it in. It's procedures <laughs> under the, the bullet for the operations and management plan that should contain the following. I've added procedures for filing and resolving of complaints. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Masidi Miller. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Commissioner Greenberg, for your comments. Um, your your comments are reinforcing my my sense that things are are um, you know what does actively seek funding really mean? I mean, why do we have something in here that has an ambiguous definition that's aspirational? That you know, how do you how do you even know if the city is actively seeking funding? What's the criteria? What are the factors? Um, you know, as I think more and more about these um, amendments that are being amended in real time, um, it, it, I'm more convinced than ever that, that um, you know, uh, accepting this tonight would be uh, a disservice to the community. It would be a disservice to uh, 
this is such a, uh, an extensive rewrite. The public hasn't had an opportunity even to consider these comments and, and share their thoughts about this, much less the other departments and other outside agencies. Um, for example, one, one, um, one of the criteria is that the sites must be available in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm not, I don't remember exactly where that is. I think it's number four. Um, you know, site locations must be in the city. It's like, well, that seems really overly restrictive to me. Um, so what you're saying is that there's a, a you know, a, a, a county, a county institute state parking program, and they have a space that's just over the, you know, it's in Live Oak, just over the outside the border with the city that, you know, that wouldn't qualify as an open space. I mean, it's like, there's some things here that are, that are just not being thought through. And I'm really worried that we're, um, if this gets approved, that, you know, we're, we're, we're just creating a monster here that, uh, that, that basically makes this program very good program, you know, to try and provide uh, a facility as much needed. Uh, we're, we're effectively torpedoing this thing before, you know, before it's even getting off the ground. So I'm, uh, those are the, my comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Mercedi Miller. Uh, we'll give Mr. Butler one more shot here, and then we're going to take it to a vote. Mr. Butler, did you have a comment? Thank you, Chair Dawson. Um, I was just going to mention that um, Commissioner Mercedi Miller hit on um, one of the points that I um, uh, had actually forgotten that in the city. Um, and if it's uh, if you're interested, I have uh, three words that could be modified there um, to um, uh, to address that. Um, uh, and if it's also the will of the commission to you know continue this. Um, and bring it back so that we can um, uh, work on the recommendations in the spirit of um, what the commission has um, sought here. We're happy to do that as well. Um, so I'll leave it to the discretion of the, uh, the commission as to whether or not they want to hear the three words. I want to hear the three words. I'm always up for hearing the three words. Okay. I, I would uh, add uh, for under where it says site, I would say some site locations and then shall be provided in the city of Santa Cruz. So then it's not dictating that they're there, um, but is that all of them are there, but that some of them shall be. And I think, you know, we fully intend that that's the case. Um, my one other change, which I didn't raise before, and that's why I didn't raise this because I thought it was tied up with that, I would get rid of portable because there might be um, actually um, permanent toilets at certain locations. So those are the three word changes. Um, the problem I have with the, the locational change you're recommending is that one of the complaints we've got from um, in the testimony is that it's a hardship for people who are down on the west side to have to drive to Aptos to find a place or even to uh, Live Oak and SoCal. And so it's I think it's it's already um, as you know we did receive testimony that having to drive it all for for people who have a hard time paying for gas is a hardship, and you know and we sort of the three miles from the west side to the east side. Well, having it outside the city means it uh, it's even further. So I mean I I guess I'm not supportive of making that change because I don't. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, extending the hardship. Uh, it was, and that was a thoughtful um, inclusion, uh, uh, revision in terms of trying to respond to the concern that people raised about how far they have to go. Uh, I am happy to take out the word portable uh, if it's uh, acceptable to the second, and because uh, I think that. Uh, that's a good suggestion. So I, okay. you know, I think, uh, Chair Dawson, you can make your comments, but I'd like to say some final things in regards to why, from my perspective, it makes sense to do this tonight rather than uh, putting it off. Okay, well, I, you know, uh, I, I'll go ahead and make my comments. I know it's getting late here. And um, I would just like to, again, thank the staff for um, one, helping me understand uh, what was 
uh, before us today and help to facilitate this meeting and being so gracious and getting back to me so quickly with the comments um, and all the work that went into the staff report. Um, but I do have some kind of basic uh, things that I want to say about um, sort of how I see our duty to act as the commission. Um, and, and really, what, what is that? What we're talking about is that people's right to sleep and um, where, where they're allowed to do that, right? And, and, and it is a constitutional right that people have to, to be able to sleep, um, just full stop. And I really believe that it is um, unequivocally within our purview that if, if, if we are going to be issuing permits or anything um, that relates to a person's right to sleep, um, that we need to take that into account. And that needs to be a kind of the primary goal for whatever we're doing. Um, and, and I do think that is before us with these permits. And we are not, um, the ordinance itself is a separate issue. And, and we have not spoken about the language in the ordinance tonight, but what we have talked about is if, if we are gonna uh, move forward with these restrictions, how do we do it in a way that maintains people's right to sleep? So I just wanna say that that is, is a major thing that we haven't talked a lot about, but that is really what it comes down to, is that people have a right to sleep, and that if we're affecting that right, we need to be, be very thoughtful about how we're supporting people's right to do that. Um, I also want to just talk about um, the part in the staff report that often gets brought up in Santa Cruz about health and health policies. And the section in the staff report kind of really, um, it, it really stood out to me because it had an analysis of, of, of the impacts to the environment and the impacts to the neighborhood, but it included no um, analysis of the impacts to the unhoused community um, taking shelter in their vehicles. And when that ability for them to sleep is disrupted um, and, and the impacts to them. So that I just am hopeful that if, if we continue to bring up health and health policies and, and we conduct these analysis, that they're comprehensive um, and they're holistic in, in, in what, we're, what is included in the staff report and for the public. Because I am not an, a public health expert, but I am able to Google and I got a stack of literature uh, that is peer reviewed that supports that there are um, very wide ranging and negative impacts um, that occur to folks that have unstable, unsecure housing situations um, that are living, um, taking shelter in their vehicles and their ability to sleep is disrupted. So when we talk about health and all policies, let's talk about health and all policies and, and not just uh, put it in there and check the box. Um, so, and then kind of the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, again, um, this, is, this is in the staff report and, and I think this is um, a mythology that I wanna take the opportunity to call out in any forum that I can that, and I think that, um, there's a lot of controversy and there's a lot of complexity um, to finding solutions, but there are solutions to um, helping people secure housing. Um, but I do want to call out the mythology that there currently exists enough housing and enough services that are needed to match the need. So it's, it's called out in the staff report and I've, I've heard um, staff and other comments that you know, we just need to hook these people up with services, and then there's a there's a straight path to housing. And I think you will get universal agreement of, among providers and practitioners that that is not the case. So that being the reality of the situation, that there is not enough housing to meet the need, um, we need to be um, mindful of providing real solutions that actually support folks that are taking shelter in their vehicles. And I feel, I feel like the conditions of approval really add some shape 
and um, give some strong guidance while still allowing flexibility to build a program that actually does what staff says the intent is, which is to actually provide more security, more st stability, more predictability um, for folks that are having to take shelter in their vehicles. So um, I, I strongly support the conditions of approval. I strongly support of moving this forward so that we can actually um, provide services um, and, and bolster their services where available. So um, looks like um, Commissioner Mercedes Miller, and then I think we'll go ahead and go to uh, uh, Commissioner Mercedes Miller. And then I think Commissioner Schiffer wanted to kind of make some closing comments. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Mercedi Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair Dawson. I have, a, I guess, a point of um, clarification and a request. Um, is it possible to introduce a substitute motion at this point in the proceeding? Uh, you can always make a substitute motion. I'm yeah. sorry? I think you can always make a substitute motion. Okay, then, then I'd like to make uh, a substitute motion. And uh, my substitute motion is that this matter be returned to staff for further consideration of the discussion that took place here tonight, that the conditions of approval, suggested conditions of approval be evaluated and, um, and an analysis done for coherence and completeness and uh, legality and, um, you know, conflict with other um, rules and such, uh, coordination with other agencies, other departments, and that this matter come back to the Planning Commission uh, at, uh, I suppose, a date certain, or if that's possible, or, or an, at another uh, commission hearing, future hearing, uh, so that uh, the commission has an opportunity to um, review this, um, these changes and the public has an opportunity to weigh in on the uh, changes that are being proposed here. Uh, I think it's a substantial change in what, what was proposed originally, and I think it would be um, wise and prudent for us to be careful, as, uh, as Chair Dawson has indicated. You know, this is important, and uh, we, we don't want to do something that has some unintended adverse consequence. So that's my motion. Okay. Second. There, okay. Second for um, motion by Ms. C.D. Miller, second to Kennedy. I might need a little parliamentary procedure help from Mr. Butler right now with the substitute motion. Um, so how do we proceed with the vote on these? So at this point, you would um, vote as to whether to accept the substitute motion. And then you would uh, debate the substitute motion and vote on the motion itself. So the first vote would be on whether to accept the substitute motion. Okay. And so um, if, I, if I may, I would suggest, you know, we could, um, if, I would suggest a date certain um, and mm -hmm. we could return in two weeks time if, uh, if it is, if, if that's the will of the commission. Okay, so would the maker of the motion like to uh, amend it to the date certain for two weeks? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Two weeks date certain. I wasn't sure about that, so I'm fine with that. Fine with okay. me too. Okay, so, so what we have on the floor is to continue the item uh, to date certain to the next planning commission meeting. Um, and so this vote is to accept that motion. Um, could we have a uh, roll call vote? And are we allowed to discuss this at all, or we have to vote before we we'll discuss it next? We can't. We can't yeah, discuss. So, so this is to put the motion on the floor for. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Butler, if you want to clarify. Um, yeah, I was. I was just doing that. <laughs> I have it open on my tablet. <laughs> Uh, I, I think what I'm reading is that we would accept the motion for consideration and then we would have a discussion and then we would vote either yes or no 
on the motion, I think, is how that goes. Chair Schifrin, or former Chair Schifrin, do you have any insight? In it seems weird that we can't. I, I think the substitute motion is always very weird. Um, that is the process that first you have to accept it and then you get to vote on it. You don't want to vote on it, why would you accept it? You don't want to support it, why would you accept it? I mean, it seems like a pretty weird process, but I, I'll defer to staff on what the procedure is and whether we can debate acceptance or not, because uh, I think that's a good question that Commissioner Greenberg has asked. And mostly I'm just wondering if we can discuss it before we vote. Yes or no? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the procedure, just to clarify how I understand the procedure, is this initial vote would just be to accept the, the motion for consideration. Then we could discuss the motion, and then we would vote yes or no on the motion. So there would be a discussion, but there's this weird first vote to bring it under consideration. So, okay. have you, are, uh, are we going with that, Mr. Butler? Oh, uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I believe that is the case. Um, it is not addressed in the Planning Commission bylaws. I just got to the place in the Council bylaws. If you want to give me one moment, I will read that, um, or, or I'm happy to read aloud. Any Council member, this, again, this is the council bylaws, and we refer to those if, there, if it's not addressed in the planning commission. Any council member, with the exception of the presiding officer, may make a motion to amend regular motion or a motion to substitute a no mo new motion for a regular motion. A motion to amend and a substitute motion are both debatable. So there's the answer. If the nature of the motion is in question, the presiding officer shall decide on whether the motion is a motion to amend um, or a substitute motion. If the motion to amend or substitute motion is, a sec is seconded, the council shall first vote on whether to accept the motion. If the council votes to accept the motion, the council shall then vote on the amended motion or the substitute motion. If the council votes not to accept the motion, the council shall then vote on the original motion. So I can decipher that for you if you need. <laughs> so you may debate it now, and there are two votes is what that boils down to. Um, you may debate it now, and if you if you vote, you first have to vote to accept the substitute motion, and then you would vote on the motion itself. Okay, so so we have two points of debate if we choose to take them. Right now, what is on the floor is the substitute motion to continue uh, this item to date certain two weeks forward. Um, does anyone want to make a comment before we take a vote? to accept the substitute motion for consideration. Uh, Chair, or <laughs> Commissioner Sisson. Yeah. From my perspective, um, I don't support a continuation. I don't think it's, uh, I don't agree that it's justified at this point. Um, so I would not vote to uh, approve this substitute motion. So it seems weird that I would be voting to accept it, especially since we can we can debate it. So um, my sense is, um, you know, I I I don't think uh, we, we've been talking about this um, for uh, quite a while. This, you know, the we've got a lot of testimony indicating that the ordinance and the and the permit provisions are really don't strike a good balance between the needs of the uh, fixed housing residents and the need for the uh, oversized vehicle residents. Um, this, what came before us tonight represents um, what the staff felt as a way to move forward, what the staff was recommending as a way to move forward. Uh, I think that the, uh, from my perspective, the, um, the original motion on the floor to revise the conditions is a is an improvement and is um, does a better job at carrying out what the um, what the staff was uh, saying the purpose was and I don't see any need to continue it so I'm not going to support the motion to uh, accept this substitute okay. motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Conway. 
And Commissioner Schiffer, and with, with respect, and I really do appreciate the work you've done tonight. I think your comments just now were, would actually be better placed after we hold a vote about whether or not to um, accept the uh, substitute motion. Um, if after debate, the substitute motion fails, we will be reverting to the uh, hastily drafted um, improvements to the conditions of approval. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to be supporting um, accepting the substitute motion. Okay, so again, what we're voting on right now is accepting for consideration a substitute motion to continue the, this item to a date certain uh, uh, in two weeks. So can we have a roll call vote to accept this uh, substitute motion for consideration from the clerk. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Unmuted aye. <laughs> Maxwell? No. Miller? Aye. Different? No. Dawson? No. So uh, motion uh, to accept for consideration, the substitute motion passes four to three. And so now we will bring up the motion for debate on whether to continue uh, to a date certain two weeks from now. Anybody have comments before we take a vote? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. I really do appreciate this whole discussion as I stated earlier. Um, I think it has been really useful um, to discuss, even though it is, the hour is getting late, Commissioner Schiffer's suggestions. Um, I think it's been really helpful, the specificity of the input that we've been able to provide um, to staff and the very interested parties has been very useful. And clearly, um, this language needs to be tightened up, cleaned up, and aligned. So well, I will be voting in favor of it. Okay, any other comments before we take a vote to, oh, um, Mr. Schifrin, go ahead. Well, I'm not sure I agree that it's clear that it needs to be uh, sent to the ringer by staff. Um, what we got tonight, um, I felt in terms of the recommendation was quite inadequate in terms of providing uh, protections for um, people in, in oversized, uh, oversized vehicles, allowing for, and you know, from my perspective, an excess of discretion. So I think that um, the, the proposed language, which, which has been amended based on staff uh, review and input, it don't, there doesn't seem to be a legal problem with it. Um, we can put it off and have the same debate in two weeks. Uh, and I, probably irrespective of what we do, then it's going to be appealed one way or the other. Uh, so I think if people feel that the changes are worthwhile, I think that's what it comes down to. If the, if the um, proposed revisions seem desirable, I think we should vote on it tonight. Um, if, you know, I, know, I understand that some of the commissioners don't think some of them are desirable uh, and we prefer not to vote on them tonight and to have staff have a chance to make a, uh, another case to change them, but you know, I think it comes down to what are commissioners' attitude to the changes, and um, obviously, as to make up the motion for those changes, I think they're um, worth making, and I think we should do it tonight and not just put it off. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Schiffrin, Commissioner Kennedy, and then Commissioner Greenberg. Go ahead, Commissioner Kennedy. All right, 
in addition to not liking some of the changes politically, um, I just have serious concerns about process and, and having things sprung on us and the public at the last minute. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Greenberg. Uh, Commissioner Greenberg, you're on mute. Um, well, I think that, um, you know, the, the response has, the effort of this response has been to take into consideration the population that's in the home that, that's housed, not all of which, you know, you know, some, some of whom uh, spoke um, on one side and, you know, populations in the vehicles as well as others who are housed who spoke on another side. And that this was a really sincere and effective effort to, you know, strengthen um, this, uh, the, you know, the permitting process and so forth in the state parking program. And I really appreciated that um, the legal counsel was able to weigh in and that, um, uh, that the planning department was able to weigh in. And I think, you know, nothing is going to be perfect, um, but that it's important to move forward in a way that takes seriously the concerns um, in the way that what has been proposed does. And so um, in that spirit, um, I would support uh, the original motion. Okay, great. Looks like we are at a vote. And just to clarify, so this is a vote to accept the substitute motion. No, this is a vote to approve the substitute motion. To approve the substitute motion. Sorry, get late. Um, okay, so could we have a roll call vote um, from the clerk, please? Yes, and just for clarification, the date for uh, March. As for the roll call, uh, Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? No. No. Aye. No. No. Okay. So that brings us back to the original motion that happened several hours ago, um, which Not is. Quite. <laughs> Uh, which is to approve the coastal development permit and the design permit with the proposed changes to the conditions of approval. Clerk, did I state that correctly? Yes. I was just saying as amended tonight. Okay, as, as amended tonight. So is everybody clear what the vote is? It's, yep, okay. Clerk, can we have a roll call vote? One way. Um, while I support most of the language, I am going to vote no because I don't, I think it's half baked. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, no, this needs to go to, through staff and they need to think about it. Aye. No. Aye. Aye. Motion uh, to approve uh, as amended tonight, the coastal development permit and the design permit passes four to three. And what about Thank you, everyone. Uh, we, we are not seeing uh, we're not taking action on the appeal. Um, Mr. Butler can clarify that, but I was directed by staff that we are not taking action or making findings on the appeal. We were just to take action on the, the coastal development permit and the design permit. Is that correct? That's correct. Hearings on appeal are de novo. So you're acting on it um, as a, a new application before you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I also just want to take this moment to thank all um, the, the members of the public that both wrote in and attended the meeting tonight. Um, 
I know that all of the commissioners take um, this, their service very seriously, and we all dug into the hundreds of pages this this um, this week and probably before. So again, um, thank you for your participation. It, it really helps inform our decisions. Okay, let's see if we can wrap this up. Um, are there any informational items? Doesn't look like I got it. one. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Kennedy. Is the process beginning next week um, regarding the city's climate action plan? And I'm working with the working group on that. So in future, not now, but later, maybe we should talk about a little subcommittee or some way for uh, planning commission to work directly with that effort. Or, you know, at least I can give reports if people are interested. I see an innate link between climate change and planning. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, I see Mr. Butler, did you have anything you wanted to add to information items? I can just provide a, a quick update on upcoming items at Planning Commission and Council, if the Commission is interested. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Briefly, of course, um, at the um, March, well, at the um, March 8th meeting, the council will be hearing a wide range of updates on homelessness and the city's homelessness response, including a three-year action plan that may be of interest to some of the commissioners here, um, particularly given the discussions that we've had this evening. Um, and um, we, on the 22nd, um, we're also, I should mention, uh, bringing the small units ordinance, the flexible density units that you all considered a month or so ago. Um, that will be on the 8th as well, going to council. Um, the, um, then on the 22nd, um, we will be bringing uh, two items, the um, small cell wireless ordinance. Um, that is an update that went to the Coastal Commission. Coastal, Coastal Commission had some changes, and so it, that goes directly back to the city council. And then um, we are also providing the uh, city council with the annual housing element and general plan update report. And we will bring that back to the planning commission as an informational item after it's been prepared. Um, we have um, on the planning commission uh, uh, the uh, 17th, we've got two items. Um, there's a uh, change to the green building fee. It's actually just a minor change in the um, ordinance language so that the council will set that fee by resolution rather than being in the ordinance itself. And then um, we are currently looking at the 415 Natural Bridges project, which is an affordable housing project right at the um, rail trail line and natural bridges there. Um, and um, then um, further down the line, we've got um, objective standards and um, even past that, um, we're looking at bringing the downtown plan um, uh, the alternatives analysis to the commission for your recommendation. Okay, action pack. All right, yes. uh, next, uh, any subcommittee advisory reports? Uh, I have a, a request on the information items. I wanted to ask uh, oh, Commissioner okay. Kennedy uh, and maybe staff to um, agendize the report on the climate action plan. I think it would be very helpful for the commission to get that report. So I appreciate your bringing it up and I look forward to, you know, I think we should maybe, you know, maybe ask staff when would be a date that we could get something um, or what would work best for you, Commissioner Kennedy, in terms of bringing that for, forward. Um, well, uh, the, we're just getting started, so why didn't I report in two weeks on information, and uh, we, could, we could talk about it. I mean, maybe we make a small subcommittee or something. Yeah, so, so yeah, uh, so there was no submit, uh, subcommittee or advisor or oral report, so items to refer to future agenda. Can we just go ahead and make sure we note in the minutes that we want to continue to discuss um, bringing that uh, report on a future agenda. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have sorry. Absolutely, sorry. Um, the point about the housing element. So that's on the twenty second at the commission. Um, 
And are we, how, what is the process whereby we weigh in on the housing elements? I'm just, I just want a clarification on that. So that's going to the, um, the city council on the uh, 20. I'm sorry, I meant the council. I said commission, yeah. I, my, my, that's okay. my dad. <laughs> uh, so this, all this is, is this is the annual report. So it's in what it is, is we uh, calculate all the numbers of permits, one that have been applied for and two that have been issued and three that have been final, as well as a range of other data points. It's really a, a really great uh, resource document. Um, and our team has been spending a lot of time putting that together because the state has actually increased the number of um, reportable uh, requirements um, substantially in recent years. So. Um, we will be presenting that information. It's due to the uh, state every year before April 1st. Mm -hmm. So we'll be presenting that information to the uh, city council in advance of that. The council has to accept it. Um, and uh, then we'll be forwarding it on to the uh, commission. And the commission typically has questions about that as well. And um, we'll, um, uh, happy to have, we're happy to have a discussion with you about any of those questions. Okay, thank you. So we can discuss like the way in which we'll we'll um, um, respond to, to that, or the way in which we may or may not weigh in on um, <laughs> relating to the housing element. Is that? I mean, is so, it? Yeah. Yeah. Is that something we could no. formally put on the agenda, or hmm. we do formally put it on the agenda each year? Yes. It's, it's an informational item. There's no action that's necessary related to it, um, but it, there typically is discussion regarding it. Uh, Commissioner Conway, go ahead. Well, I just want to clarify um, that this is not the the housing element itself, and it, which is going to be a long process, and commission will have many opportunities to weigh in on how we're addressing it and many other questions. This is an annual report that's due. It's always a scramble because yeah. it is a huge amount of information. Um, and to get it to the, um, the council in time is always a scramble. So we get to uh, the benefit of it later, mm -hmm. um, but we're not gonna be changing the report at that time. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, um, Commissioner Conway. And so understanding this work, the, you know, what's coming down the road in terms of when and in what ways we will be weighing in post April 1st, I guess would be would be really helpful to understand um, the plan. The agenda is an informational yeah. item for staff to present on sort of the process, process and, and yeah. a future meeting. Would that address your concerns, Commissioner Green? That would be super helpful, yeah. We're happy to talk about the, the process. We typically give a, a brief presentation um, similar to what we do to council because there is the, the data is really, um, it's, it's rich. So there's a lot of detail in there. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Butler. I really appreciate that. Of course. Okay, thank you. Um, Anything else, items uh, to refer to future agenda? Okay, I just uh, wanna thank everybody for attending. Thanks to my colleagues, um, fellow commissioners, and I will bring the uh, March 3rd, uh, 2022 planning commissioning meeting to adjournment. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you, good night. Good night.